On? Yep. Good evening and welcome to the July 6th council meeting. Tonight's meeting is going to be a little bit different due to some legal requirements that we have to meet. But first, uh, I'd like to note that all council members are present except for Councilman Flores. If you'd please stand, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Lucio will lead us in the flag salute. Please join me in putting your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first item this evening is going to be a public hearing for our redistricting. Prior to a vote of the City Council, any member of the audience will have the opportunity to address Council on any of the items listed under public hearings. Council requests, but it's not required that you state your name and address prior to making any remarks. Item number one, 2021-2022 redistricting process. This item tonight is to receive a report outlining the 2021-2022 redistricting process and begin to consider potential neighborhoods and communities of interest per Assembly Bill 849 requirements. I'd like to declare the public hearing open and ask for a staff report from our management analyst, um, Jack Morgan, and also our National Geographics Corporation. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. So tonight we're gonna to be kicking off what is going to be a series of public hearings on the city's redistricting process. Um, it, per elections code, any time that a census is completed, a city needs to take a look at its voting districts. And once they're redrawn, they need to ensure that those voting districts are substantially similar in population. In addition to that, per the Fair, the Fair Maps Act and Assembly Bill 849, um, there are additional uh, criteria that the city is going to have to consider. Those are nuanced and they can be complicated and they're really going to guide us as we're going through this process to adopt a new voting district map. So to help us with that, we contracted with National Demographics Corporation, as the council may recall and the public as well. We had contracted with National Demographics Corporation back in 2016 when they assisted us with our transition from an at-large election process to a by district election process. Um, and so I have with me uh, Jeff uh, Simonetti, who's gonna be going through a PowerPoint presentation to outline the Fair Maps Act and the game plan we have set up for this redistricting process. Additionally, we have Doug Johnson, who directly helped us back in 2016. He's joining us via GoToWebinar, and so he'll be available to answer any questions as well. So with that, I will transition the presentation over to Jeff. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Jeff Simonetti, and I'm with the National Demographics Corporation. We appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you and walk through some of the demographics and the sort of key parts of the redistricting process. So the purpose of tonight's public hearing is really to go through a couple of things. To talk about the 2021 redistricting process, talk about how the decennial census is going to affect the new district, the new districts, talk about project timelines and key deadlines, as Mayor Uloa mentioned, there's a new, new concept here related to neighborhoods and communities of interest that was different to the last districting cycle that you folks went through in 2016, and then talk about next steps and hearings. So as you are aware, we switched from at-large districts to districts in 2016, and we have a at-large mayor, and then there are different staggered terms for the districts. So districts two and three, their terms expire in November of 2022, and districts one and four, their terms expire in November of 2024. 
For this redistricting process, the new maps will be effective and apply to both of these elections that are listed here. There are a couple of main steps in the redistricting process here and I'll walk through. We are currently in the stage of what we call initial pre-draft hearings. You have to have at least one hearing prior to the release of draft maps. And we'll have this, this hearing here on July 6th and we're scheduled for a second hearing on September 7th. At this, we'll be really talking a little bit more about the education aspect of this. And we wanna get input from the general public as well as the city council on the communities of interest in the neighborhoods within the cities. We will then have an initial deadline for draft maps. And so the process here, as you may have heard, the COVID crisis has delayed the release of the census data. In 10 years ago, we would have had the, the census data out by now. However, due to those delays, we're anticipating that the final data that we'll be, uh, we'll be using for the maps will be available in either late September or early October. So at that point, we will have an online mapping tool where the general public will be able to submit maps uh, for consideration amongst the council. We'll release those draft maps and they'll be posted on the, the redistricting website. And if you see in the middle box there, the website, we have a specific website for the redistricting process. It's cityofchino.org slash redistricting. After we release the draft maps, there will be two public hearings on uh, to discuss and revise those maps and to discuss the election sequence. The election sequence is which districts vote in which election. We're tentatively scheduled for those uh, January 18th and February 15th. And then there will be the map adoption phase. So we have that tentatively scheduled for March 1st of 2022 and March 15th. This process has to be completed by no later than April 17th of 2022, and that's the deadline to be able to submit those draft maps to the San Bernardino County Registrar of Voters. So in the process here, we have guidelines and laws as that, that govern the redistricting process. And we put those into three main buckets. The first one on the left is the federal laws. So we have to have generally equal population between the districts, and we have to follow the tenets of the Federal Voting Rights Act. There can also be no racial gerrymandering. In the second bucket in the middle where we say here, California criteria for cities, this is a little bit different than in the 2016 process. So as uh, Mayor Uloa mentioned, we have to follow the tenets of AB 849, and this is the criteria that AB 849 sets and they're in rank order. So first we have to comply, as we mentioned, with the Federal Voting Rights Act requirements. Second, the districts have to be geographically contiguous and can't have any islands. There are neighborhoods and communities of interest that have to be undivided, and we'll talk about that here a little bit more in a moment. The boundaries need to be easily identifiable and they have to be compact. And when we say on compact districts, what that means is you can't take a population, certain population segment that's further away uh, in, instead of population that's closer by. Then finally, we have other traditional redistributing pr principles that will apply here to the, to the city. On the first bullet point here, when we talk about respecting voters' choice and continuity in office, what we mean is making sure that we minimize the number of voters who are potentially moved uh, from a district, let's say you would be voting in 2022, but the lines get redrawn and you'd move to a district in 2024. We're trying to minimize the amount of voters that would be impacted by that. And as you'll see here in a moment, we certainly have had uh, population growth since the last five years when we completed the districting process in 2016. And we continue to anticipate with areas like College Park and the Preserve for future growth. The next slide here looks at the estimated current district makeup, and this is taking a look at the population for each one of the current districts. Now, this will change uh, when, we, when we have the, our new districts, and to be clear, these are estimated numbers. We get this data from the American Communities Survey, which is part of the decennial census. As you can see here, the, the important figures are in that first box on the top. And when you see the percentage deviation from ideal, what that means is when we were talking about in the Federal Voting Rights Act where we have to have 
as close to equal population in the districts as possible. You can see as a result of the population increases, particularly in districts three, but, all, but primarily in district four, we've seen a significant increase in population in those districts, and districts one and two are now uh, off, of the, off of the deviation. So that is part of the reason why the districts need to be redrawn. As part of the American Community Survey, we get some pretty detailed information on what we call CVAP, or citizen voting age population. And these are comparison maps. On the right is the 2016 data that we had on Latino voting age population. And on the left is the 2021 data. It's, it hasn't changed substantially, but as you can see, uh, the Latino neighborhoods tend to be in the southern part of the city as well as in the central portions. This is the same data, uh, but for Asian voting age population, 2016 on the right, 2021 on the left. And uh, again, most of the Asian voting age population is in districts three and four, particularly in the southern part of the city. Get some other interesting data as well from the American Community Survey, and this will be part of the districting maps and layers once we get into, the, into drawing the, the maps, and this will be on the online mapping tool. One of the interesting things that I mentioned here is that we get data on percentage of those renting properties, and as you can see, the, the concentration of renters within the city, again, is in the southern part of the city. One more on demographics of percentage of those living with a child at home. So as we mentioned, there's new criteria here related to AB 849, and there are two different definitions that we're going to begin discussing tonight, and then when we have our second public hearing on September 7th, that will be where we're really uh, looking to receive feedback and input on what we want to define as your neighborhoods and what we want to define as your communities of interest. So a neighborhood is really what you would think of it. So it's a geographic area that has meaningful boundaries and meaning meaningful physical locations. So boundaries that can identify a neighborhood might be streets, you might be around a school district or a certain area in the, in the city. It could be natural boundaries, rivers, mountains, those types of things. Other landmarks that may be unique to the community. When we go into defining communities of interest, that takes your particular geographic boundary, but takes it one step further. In the first bullet point there that you see, are there shared characteristics in a given area? May that be a shared social or economic interest that would make that area be held together? And the crux of the issue that we are trying to get at when we are both defining neighborhoods and communities of interest are, would this community of interest or neighborhood benefit from being included within a single district for the purposes of its fair representation per Assembly Bill 849? Or would it be better for those residing within that district to benefit by having more than one uh, city council member representing them. Now, one important thing to remember is that in communities of interest and neighborhoods, they may not include relationships with political parties, incumbents, or political candidates. We have some examples here of possible neighborhoods and communities of interest, and this is really to get the conversation started. So uh, an area might be the Preserva Chino. College Park, the area we're in right now, downtown Chino and the Civic Center and the neighborhoods around City Hall. We have some of the lower density residential or agricultural area in neighborhoods north of the 60 freeway. And please feel free, if you have other ideas beyond the ones that we've listed here, we'd be happy to hear and we'd be certainly seeking feedback on that. So this sort of hearing sets the table on the discussion, and we want you to start thinking about what your neighborhoods and communities of interest are. At the September 7th hearing, we will be considering particularly what are your neighborhoods of communities of interest, what are the cultural or social bonds that define those communities of interest, where is that neighborhood located, and why should that neighborhood be connect, kept together in a single voting district. At the September 7th hearing, we'll be making a specific motion and be getting a vote and feedback from the city council as to what those will be. And then those will be put into the maps 
for the uh, for your online mapping tool and will be considered as part of the later hearings once we be, uh, begin drawing the draft maps. There are a couple of different ways that you can participate um, and give us your feedback and thoughts on what your neighborhoods and communities of interest will be. Um, we have the city clerk's office number here and we have a specific email address which is districts at cityofchino.org um, where your feedback can be included in the September 7th report. And you can certainly provide pro public or verbal testimony at this meeting and that meeting as well. Finally, we have some, a few more next steps and in information. Our September 7th uh, will be the, the next city council meeting where we'll be holding that public hearing. And that will be one of at least four public meetings. So we need to have one public hearing before the maps are released and then at least four total. The redistricting website is available, as I mentioned, at the cityofchino.org slash redistricting. We anticipate, as I mentioned, that the data will be available by October of 2021. We'll talk a little bit more at the September 7th hearing about what the public mapping tools and when they'll be made available. And finally, the final map must be adopted by no later than April 17th of 2022. Um, and these maps will be used in the, in the 2022 general municipal elections. So with that, we appreciate your time and would be happy to answer any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you, Jeff. Do any council members have questions for Jeff or for our staff? No? Okay, then I will ask if there are any public members that have questions. I do have one written request to speak and that's Stubby Barr. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. I thought there'd be a lot of interest in this, but apparently not. So I, um, I have recently become involved in a couple of projects uh, involving the original town proper area, which is uh, originally A to H and 1st to 15th. Right now it is Riverside to Chino and um, Benson to Monte Vista. Um, that area is now divided into two voting districts with the Chino uh, separating them, or Central Avenue separating them. Um, and what I'm seeing is that we have the same socioeconomic conditions on both sides, especially in the area bounded by Riverside, Benson, Chino, and Central. It really needs to be incorporated into District 1 or into the same district that the other half of this property is. They share the same problems, they have the same concerns, they have the same social issues, uh, and they have the same civic problems. So I would really like to see that happen. I think it would simplify things if both of the people I'm talking to on opposite sides of Central had the same representative. Thank you. Welcome. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to address the council on the redistricting? Angela, do we have anyone online? No, Mayor, we do not. Okay, then I will close the public hearing. There's no vote required for this item. Are there any last minute or additional comments from council? Okay, then um, we will look forward to the September 7th public hearing. Thank you very much for the presentation. We're gonna have a very brief recess while we set up for our regular part of the agenda. So it'll probably take about five minutes. Okay, we're gonna resume our council meeting now, if I can have your attention. This month, Brenda. <laughs> this month is Parks and Recreation Month. And before we read off the proclamation and call the folks up, we're going to be presenting a video highlighting Chino's exceptional parks and recreation programs, as well as the staff and community services and public works who work hard to provide the Chino community with excellent service all year long. So let's roll the video. To me, Parks and Recreation is just that connection between the community and our staff. I think we're like that front line that works with the people um, on a regular basis and just gets to be the face of the community, really. My name is Charlie Rosales. My name is Kim. My name is Maya. My name is Jonna Shipley. My name is Miss Tammy. My name is Holly Rodriguez. I oversee youth sports, adult sports, boxing, and Iola Park. We build all the parks and facilities for the community. 
I do after school, special events, tiny tots in the youth museum. I take care of all city-owned facilities. I oversee programs, events, and classes. As a community services department, we ensure that all of the parks in the city of Chino is safe, as well as putting on programs that the community loves. My favorite part about Parks and Recreation is the opportunities we provide to our community. Parks and Recreation programs is important for the community because it allows them to have a balance between their daily life and work and the ability to actually participate in fun activities. I love being able to talk to customers. Everybody always comes into the museum with a smile on their face. So I love being able to interact, watch the children play, kind of see their imaginations grow. I love being able to interact with the public and creating different experiences for people, um, whether it's gardening, hiking, things that they maybe aren't normally doing on their day-to-day -day basis. Growing up in the city of Chino, participated in a lot of the programs that we currently offer, and so park and recreation to me just means being able to build community, to make new friends, to just enjoy life. During COVID-19, we were able to deliver meals to our seniors to keep them safe in their homes during these challenging times. One of my feel-good moments working with the seniors was hosting Legends, the Senior Challenge this year. It was an adapted version, but it was great to be able to have the seniors come out, play some competitive games with us, all while having fun and getting to see their friends and interact with us. My favorite part about working on this field is the clients that I get to work with. I enjoy getting to work with a range of different people from different cultures, age groups, in my counseling services. What motivates me uh, coming to work every day is making an impact to those kids, seeing the kids smile. That's something I never knew had a lot of power until I actually started experiencing it. A feel-good moment is when we started our homework success program. We brought kids who were struggling with homework under COVID-19 and learning from home and we were able to bring them into the classroom and give them the tools that they needed to succeed during class. My favorite thing about work is knowing that in some way or another, I help develop memories. Everybody always remembers and has a great experience in any center that they're involved in. This is our park and recreation story. This is our park and recreation story. This is our parks and recreation story. What's yours? What's yours? What's yours? What's yours? Oh, great video. <laughs>Okay, on our proclamation reads, whereas three out of four Americans live within walking distance of a park and on average visit their local park and recreation facilities more than twice a month, 50% of households participate in an organized recreation program and most park use is with family and friends. Parks and recreation programs are vital to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in Chino and contribute to the economic and environmental well-being of our community. Parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease and improves the mental and physical health of all citizens and serve as a respite, respite for Chino residents during the COVID-19 pandemic. Parks and recreation programs provide positive alternatives for children and youth during non-school hours to reduce crime, helping youth develop and grow into healthy, productive adults. And whereas in Chino, we're fortunate to have over 250 acres of parkland and open space, which provides opportunities for our community to celebrate the outdoors. The Chino Community Services Department has adopted the California Park and Recreation Society's Park Make Parks Make Life Better slogan and logo to promote the benefits of parks and recreation. <clears throat> and whereas since 1985, July is celebrated across the nation as Park and Recreation Month. Whereas the city of Chino urges all residents to recognize that parks and recreation enriches the lives of residents and visitors, as well as adding value to the community's homes and neighborhoods, making Chino a great place to live, work, and play. Now, therefore, I, Eunice Emiloa, mayor of the city of Chino, do hereby proclaim July 2021 as Park and Recreation Month in the city of Chino and urge all residents to enjoy, recognize, and help promote the benefits derived from quality programs, services, and parks, which provide something of value to everyone. And I'd like to introduce Jamie Harwood from our Community Services Commission. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, how lucky are we all to live in Chino with the parks uh, that we have and the community services department that we have? Uh, from Public Works, who makes the parks literally sparkle in the morning, 
um, to all the community services people here, look at them, they're all smiling. They're always smiling, which is just so awesome because it makes working with them just, just amazing. Um, you folks have done such a great job in the past year developing new programs, innovating what we had, uh, and just you know making this whole last crazy pandemic year as wonderful as it could be for Chino residents. Um, on a personal note, I want to thank all of you for helping me out with our uh, 5K on Saturday morning, the Let Freedom Run 5K, uh, as well as the other events that, that we do for the YMCA and the Youth Museum. They're always out there helping, um, always with a smile. It's just, it's just fantastic. I love working with Stephen. Um, I love working with Lizette and Haley, and I wish I knew all of your names, but I know all of your faces. And you're always out there willing to help and just do a fantastic job. So thank you very much. You're the, the, you're the, the heroes of Chino, I think, especially in the past year, um, to really help this community get through this pandemic and feel better. And I, I look forward to working with all of you uh, in the future. I also want to add my congratulations. I mean, during the pandemic and the horrible things that everybody went through, you really were the uh, representatives from Chino that kept a lot of people going. I mean, there were people that were afraid in their homes, the seniors especially, those that delivered food to the seniors and kept them safe, kept them in mind so that they didn't feel like they were forgotten. So while so many people struggled, you were out there with the courage to still continue to serve our residents. It's what makes Chino special. We have probably the greatest staff, bar none, anywhere in California or the United States, I am proud to say. So thank you so much for everything that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's yours. Okay. Thank you very much. See, City Manager Ballantyne, do we have any additions or revisions to our agenda? I have no changes to the agenda, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Next on our agenda is public announcements. This is the time and the place for the Mayor to inform the public of all upcoming events and past occurrences. First, please mark your calendars for the 2021-2029 Housing Element Update Community Workshop Number 2, being held in the City Council Chambers with a virtual option available on Tuesday, July 13th from 6 to 8 p.m. This workshop will allow the public to learn about and provide input on the different parts of the 2021-2029 draft housing element document, which is available at the city's website at www.cityofchino.org forward slash housing element. For more information on the housing element workshop, please email our city planner, Warren Morleone, at WMORELION at cityofchino.org. Additionally, we will be holding our office hours at the Preserve this Thursday, July 8th, at the Preserve Community Center from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. to answer any questions or concerns you may have about the city. For all questions, please call 909-334-3304. Also, please mark your calendars to, uh, to the kickoff of our Kiwanis, Chino Kiwanis Summer Concerts on the Lawn Series. The Concerts on the Lawn Series will begin this Thursday, July 8th, at the City Hall Lawn and will occur every Thursday up until August 5th. All Concerts on the Lawn will run from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. and admission is free. For July 8th, all participants will be able to enjoy Hot August Night, a Neil Diamond tribute band. Kiwanis will offer one additional concert at Founders Park in the Preserve on August 14th, with more, deal, more details to follow. For all questions, please call Chino Kiwanis website, I mean, please visit, don't call it, Chino Kiwanis website at www.chinokiwanis.com. And last, 
please come out, come on out for another installment of our Chino Summer Nights Movies on the Lawn series on Friday, July 9th from 6.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the City Hall Lawn. For July 9th, we'll be showing the movie Adventures of Rufus, the Fantastic Pet. For all questions, please call our Community Service Department at 909-334-3258. Next on our agenda is public communication. Public comments, this is the time for the general public to address the council about items that are not, on, not elsewhere on the agenda. Our first written request to speak this evening is actually going to be our Chief Wes Simmons. He's going to lead us in an invocation. All those who would like to join, please stand. Thank you, Mayor, and please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the blessings you've poured on the city, your continued protection on the men and women who live in this community, Lord. As we just heard, this is a fabulous com community, and we know it's because your hand has been on this community. Lord, I want to pray for all the City of Chino employees as they diligently work this past year, or many others, uh, many other cities uh, close their lobbies. We continue to serve this community, and I just thank you for those employees. Lord, and I, and I ask for a special um, prayer of protection on the men and women who are serving in our police department and our fire department, that we, you would continue to protect them and their families as they serve. Ask for your continued wisdom and discernment on our city council as they guide this city as we move forward into the future. Thank you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wes. Okay. Next item on the agenda is a consent calendar. Uh, I have several items that have re been requested to be pulled. Item number five and number seven are being pulled. Do any council members wish to have any other items pulled? Okay, seeing none, any members of the public wish to have any other, other items pulled? Okay, seeing none, then I would ask for a uh, motion and a second on the balance of the consent calendar. Okay, there's a motion from Mayor Pro Tem Lucio, second from Councilwoman Comstock. And the balance of the consent calendar passes unanimously with those present. Okay, item number five, increase to the per meeting compensation amounts for the Planning and Community Services Commission. This is to adopt resolution number 2021-049, increasing the Planning and Community Services Commission per meeting stipends amount to 125 a meeting and 75 a meeting, respectively. Uh, I have one written request to speak. That's from Stubby Barr. Thank you again, Mayor. Hopefully this thing's working, right? I'm not gonna move it this time. <clears throat> uh, good, uh, thank you, uh, good evening again, Council. So thank you, um, Councilman Bocock, for bringing this forward. It appears that this is long overdue, uh, as you would know, having served on the Planning Commission. But in reading the um, proposal, I'm, I'm struck. We just watched a demonstration of just a small portion of what the Community Services Commission does. They may not get as much recognition. They definitely don't get as much public support. But they work their little butts off every week, uh, whether they have a meeting or not. And I feel that the stipend, uh, which is a per meeting stipend anyway, uh, should be equal. It is in most places. The one we have now is, is equivalent. Uh, we don't devalue one commission commissioner um, because of the work that they that they do and the work that the Community Services Commission does it is the heart and the soul of Chino. I mean, I think we just saw a video, we saw all those smiling faces and that is maybe a fifth of what the Community Services Commission oversees. I would like to see that the stipend be the same for all commissioners. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your input. <clears throat> Are there any other members of the public that have any input on this item? Okay, council discussion. Any council comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have a recommendation before us to increase the Planning Commission to 125 a meeting and the Community Services Commission 
to 75 a meeting. Then I, with no comments, I would entertain a motion and a second. It's a motion from Councilman Pocock, second from Mayor Pro Tem Lucio. Oops. And the item passes four with one absent. Item number seven that was pulled, notice of the completion, Chino Avenue Storm Drain Project SD-151. This is to accept the Chino Avenue Storm Drain, Benson Avenue to Oaks Avenue, Project SD-151 is complete. Approve and ratify a first change order, authorize the city manager to file a notice of completion, and release undisputed retention funds. Uh, we have one written request to speak once again, that being Stubby Bar. Uh, Stubby has requested a staff report. I would like to ask Amr or... Maria Fraser. Will okay, Maria will provide the staff reports this evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council <clears throat> and audience. The Chino Storm Drain Project dates back to 2016. At that time, Young & Associates, the original contractor, was unable to fulfill his contractual obligations. On May 18, council determined that the contractor had defaulted on his obligations. The city of Chino called upon the surety company, uh, American Contractors Indemnity Company, to complete the work. The city and the surety company entered into an agreement to complete the remaining items of work. The surety company has completed all the reminder works per the terms and conditions, and although staff recognizes the need to construct uh, ramps along the north side of Chino, Avenue at 16, 17, and 19, which were which are T intersections, and we recognize this was not a part of the original scope of work. Um, therefore, it's our recommendation that council approves the staff report within the recommendations indicated. This concludes my report, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And Maria, when are these additional ramps going to be constructed? These additional ramps are currently under uh, design. We will expect the design to be completed in October and, and construction completed by the end of the year. And these ramps were not part of the actual Project SD-151. This is over and above. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Stubby, your comments? I have one question first. Um, I would like to know the change order that's presented tonight indicates that it's for ADA requirements imposed um, and I would like to know what exactly those ADA requirements are. Uh, this is, change order of, appears to only cover uh, asphalt paving. Maria, can you address uh, that? Actually, please? the change orders were not related to ADA. It was related for items of work that were not in the schedule of values by the contractor. And if I recall, I'm going by memory right now, it had to do with adjustment of manholes, double adjustments of manholes that were not included initially and it had nothing to do with um, uh, ADA requirements or work. Okay. I'm looking at the change order right now, and you're right. It's manholes and rings, manhole and ring uh, grinding. Mayor, on page, um, gee, I don't, can't see what page it is, 46. Packet page 46. Yes. This change reflects additional ADA requirements imposed as well as field modifications required by unanticipated utility conflicts. I don't see that on page 46, Stubby. 45, well I can't read, it is, yep, page 46. You see where it says request and justification for change? No. Then my page numbers are messed up. Item 87B. Do you see it? I don't see it. It's the one, two, three, four, fifth page, sixth page. Oh, I see. It's in teeny tiny writing. 
anticipate yeah. utility conflicts. Okay, and so what is your question, Stubby? 26. No, I just wanted that clarification because the work out there just did not correct any of the ADA issues. So <clears throat> I have a presentation that I prepared earlier for you. I'd like to, to whip through it very quickly. Okay, Stubby, I'm going to make a request starting from tonight on. When you have presentations, I would like you to present them to us or to staff before the council meeting so we have an opportunity to see what's coming up and so that we can address them. That is very difficult to do. When you only post the agenda, the minimum 72 hours in advance, people have other things to do. I actually started this, looking on this and working on this, this afternoon at about 1 o'clock. So, and I did give it to staff as soon as I came in. It's comments. They're supposed to be familiar with this. You give me three days to, at the absolute most, to respond to a staff report, and then staff asks for continuance or, or a, um, a tabling of the issue so they can have weeks to work up a response. It does not seem fair. Well, you hit us at an awkward position where we can't possibly answer some of the things that you ask. I'm not asking you to answer anything. I'm asking you to just look at my testimony. It's visual. It consists mostly of photographs. I want you to realize the history behind this. This is a very long, deep, and complicated project. And when staff tells you that the ramps are not re uh, re part of the project, they are totally incorrect because the ramps are required by law to be installed during the project at the same time as the project. It's federal law. In going to be installed now. And you cannot accept the project as final because when you accept the project as final, then the installation of the curb ramps is not concurrent with the project. Fred, do you have a comment? Uh, I do. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council members. The, the issue I think that we're facing is that when the design plans were approved for bidding, those, those particular improvements may not have appeared on the plans. And so to require a contractor to do work that was never in the original plans, the, the council either has the option to do a change order and add additional items to a contract that were never part of the scope. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have an opinion to, as I sit here today about whether the, these were actually required ADA improvements, but setting that aside, this is a contract issue. So the opportunities for the council are to either finalize this and do the uh, and accept the project and include these as part of your CIP project or an upcoming project, as, as your staff has mentioned. But to require this of the contractor when the contract never included in the plans and specs would be a, a, an obligation the contractor would not have. Okay. Go ahead with your presentation. No, I'm not going to do a presentation. I am sorry. Um, <clears throat> I will approach this from a different angle, and I assure you that this problem and the rest of these issues, which are occurring continuously on all of these projects, um, will be taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have an item in front of us, item number seven. I would uh, entertain a motion and a second. Motion from Councilman Co Pocock, second from Council person Comstock. And oh, on it. Well, this is weird. Okay, the vote did not go right, Angela. Can you okay there. It was approved unanimously, all four. Okay. Next item on the agenda is under public hearings, item number fifteen. Annexation to Landscape and Lighting District 2002-1, Zone 84 of Site Approval PL 13-0629 for the Compressed Natural Gas Fueling Station. Approved Resolution 2021-048, ordering the annexation of Site Approval PL 13-0629 into the Landscape and Lighting District Number 2002-1, or Annexation Zone Number 84 for the Compressed Natural Gas Fueling Station for USA Waste of California Incorporated located at 13821 Redwood Avenue. I'd like to declare the public hearing open and ask for a staff report from our city engineer, Chris Magdoscu. 
Thank you, Mary's, uh, Mayor and City Council. Uh, uh, Chris Magdoscu, City Engineer. Uh, tonight is a duly noticed public hearing uh, set for annexation to a landscape lighting and maintenance district. Uh, you adopted resolution number 2021-030 on May 4th of this year, ordering the preparation of an engineer's report as part of the two-step annexation process. Uh, before you tonight, so just a quick graphic out of the staff report and also for the public to see that uh, the project located on Redwood Avenue at Anderson, uh, right here, is there's a street light that was built as a part of the condition of approval at the intersection of Anderson and Redwood uh, between the two new driveways at the compressed natural uh, gas uh, fueling station. Uh, again, uh, that project was PL13-0629, as identified in your staff report and is on the graphic. The estimated assessment for that single street light is about approximately $170 per year, which will be adjusted based on actual costs for maintenance and energy, including CPI adjustments. And as you know, and I remind uh, the council every time that a, that a landscape lighting maintenance district is done to lighten the burden on the city's general fund uh, for ongoing maintenance for those uh, public improvements, this one being a street light. With that, concludes my staff report, and staff recommends approving resolution number 2021-048 ordering the annexation of site approval PL 13-0629 into LLMD District 2002-1, zone number 84. Thank you, and that concludes my staff report. I'm prepared to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Any questions from the council to Chris? Okay, seeing none. Any questions or comments from the public on this item? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion or I'd like to close the public hearing and then entertain a motion in a second. Motion from Mayor Pro Tem Lucio, second from Councilwoman Comstock. The item passes 4-0 with one absent. Under continued business, item number 16, notice of completion TDA bicycle access improvements project ST-182. This item is to accept the TDA bicycle access improvement project ST-182 as complete, releasing the retention funds and issue the notice of completion. Maria uh, Frazier, our CIP engineering manager, and Dennis Rawls, transportation manager, will provide staff report this evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, council members and audience. Um, this project was brought to council on June 16, 2021, during which some concerns were raised. Um, the concerns were basically, as you can read in the um, presentation, uh, same placement behind sidewalks, access accessible paths of travel, uh, sign removals and sidewalk restoration, lane lines across placement, and shared locations. Uh, first and foremost, the, the City of Chino accessibility policy refers to compliance in terms of two types of projects. One is alterations, and one is new facilities. The scope of this project is neither an alteration or a new facility. The striping provide, provided does not change the way in which the facilities is used. The bikes and the cars are already using the street and share the road. <coughs> this project just provides additional guidance and awareness for bicyclists and vehicles and it does, it does not change by any manner the way the facility is used. Uh, Dennis will expand a little more in some of the technicalities, and with that, we'll pass it on to Dennis. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, the TDA project, bike lane project, uh, was part of the implementation of the 2016 Bike and Pedestrian Master Plan. Uh, specifically in that master plan, it identified a section of uh, some of our streets listed as a high priority uh, in terms of installing bike facilities, uh, specifically trying to connect uh, various uh, areas of interest such as schools, bus stops, and um, city facilities like the library. Um, as part of this project, we installed two types of bike lanes, a class two bike lane uh, 
uh, as represented up in the top right, which is a dedicated portion of the roadway that is delineated from the rest of the roadway, specifically dedicated for bicycles. The other type of bicycle facility that's provided is a class three, known as a shared bike route. In this case, we provide signage and, and markings that indicate that the roadway uh, is to be shared uh, with both bicyclists and, road and, and vehicles. This is already allowed uh, by law, but it, it provides some enhancements and provides some visual cues to both the vehicle traveler and the bicyclist to, uh, to use these routes specifically for bikes and to bring more awareness and provides wayfinding. Um, the streets involved are shown both on the map inlaid as well as the streets listed uh, uh, below. Uh, I did want to point out though that originally the design of the project did include uh, streets around Chino High School. However, as we're all aware, Chino High School is currently under construction and as part of that construction we'll be doing some improvements to their frontage. Uh, we felt that at this time it was uh, inappropriate to install uh, the lane markings at this time as they were probably going to be damaged uh, with the construction by the, the Chino High School project. And so earlier this year, the city council approved um, um, a motion to remove that part of the project from this project and add it as part of the city's contribution towards improvements along Chino High School. Um, I wanted to bring up this paragraph. This comes straight from the California Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Vice Devices, the MUTCD. And it, it's important because it helps frame the rest of the discussion for this presentation. And specifically that although the MUTCD does provide very clear and detailed um, descriptions on how signs are constructed, what they look like, where they're placed, how they're positioned, uh, and so forth, that is provided solely for guidance and as an example uh, that uh, understanding and information and they are not considered a legal standard. Uh, further, that engineering must be, engineering judgment must be used to apply these guidelines two specific examples. And then finally, that the MUTCD is not intended to be a substitute for engineering knowledge, experience, and judgment. Um, that's particularly important because some of the choices that were made by staff in the design of this project do uh, take off a little bit from what is uh, shown in the MUTCD as proper application. And so I'll be going into a little further detail about what that inv involves and why, it was, uh, why those decisions were made. So to start off on 12th Street, this is a segment between B Street and Chino, we installed the class two bike lane. It's actually the only class two bike lane in the project. Um, in, in this particular case, the roadway was wide enough to maintain the uh, curb adjacent parking in front of the residence uh, of eight feet, add a six foot wide bike lane adjacent to that parking and reduce the travel lane down to 10 feet. So this is a great example of some traffic calming complete street um, uh, type installation and one that uh, we applied as part of this project. And you can see the, the bike lanes in, in there as well as the legends and signage on the street light. Uh, in other areas of the city, uh, we unfortunately didn't have enough curb to curb width to fully install uh, a bike lane without remove, removing on-street parking. So in these cases, we installed the class three bike lane like we described before. Uh, and just a reminder, as class three bike routes uh, these are where we are designating these routes as bike lanes, but to doing so as part of a shared route where the bicyclists and the vehicle are, are intended to share the lane. Uh, to do that, we install both signage and roadway markings. Uh, and specifically, the, the original design called for um, several uh, bike and markings along the roadway. Uh, many of these occurred at the entrance, the beginning of intersections, as well as alleyways. Well, shortly after construction, we started receiving phone calls from the public concerning the amount of signs that are being installed. The specific concerns um, revolved around uh, the overabundance of the usage of signage and how that was uh, detouring from the character and nature of the neighborhood. And so there's concerns that um, we were basically spamming the neighborhood with signs, if you will. So in hearing those concerns, we went back and looked at the designs. We reviewed the MUTCD requirements and took a look at what was the real purpose of adding these signs along these streets in these residential neighborhoods, and could we get away with uh, removing some of their installation? And the answer was, yes, we can. Uh, not all those signs were necessary. Uh, not that it was incorrect or, or wrong. Uh, certainly, you could have placed these signs and it would have had the effect. Uh, that we were looking for. But ultimately, these signs are intended to bring visibility and, and guidance to vehicles and, and bicyclists that they're going to be sharing these roadways together. 
And specifically along these streets in these neighborhoods, uh, specifically this photo I think is, I forget if it's B Street or C Street, uh, you have these block after block after block uh, roadways uh, where we were installing these signs. So although we removed signs um, and markings on the roadway, if you drive out there today, or as you drive down these streets, you'll, you won't just see one sign, you'll see multiple signs in your field of view. And so I felt very comfortable with uh, removing um, a, a lot of the signs. In fact, 136 that were originally scheduled to be installed or were installed uh, were either removed or not installed. Uh, and the change order that was uh, previously presented at last council meeting reflects that. Uh, the signs that, uh, all the signs that were installed, um, the city does retain ownership of those. Those are in our inventory. Some of those have been redeployed to other locations in the city where our signs have faded. And so although we, we didn't install them for this purpose, the city will be using the rest of those signs for its ongoing maintenance of other signs in the city uh, of the same type, um, uh, which also helps us with our, our, our uh, long-term maintenance. One of the other uh, concerns was the placement of, of the signs uh, along the, uh, the entire route of the project. And uh, one of the things that's uh, important from a traffic's perspective is to make sure that the sign is placed in such a manner that it does its job. It needs to be visible to both the, the vehicles and the bicyclists traveling down the roadway. And so although we do have right of way in some cases um, uh, behind sidewalk, uh, in, some, in most instances, uh, the best place for the sign was behind the curb. That makes it uh, very conspicuous and it allows for uniformity in the placement of that sign so that uh, both drivers and bicyclists uh, can uh, keep an eye on where those signs are at and know where to expect to see them. Uh, wherever we could, if there was an existing pole nearby where we planned to install a sign or a street light, we of course did so. We, you know, one of the things, one of my biggest pet peeves is to install a sign post feet away from an existing street light where that sign could have been placed on. So that was, uh, all of the sign locations were reviewed for that specifically, uh, and uh, wherever possible was done. Uh, in terms of the placing the sign behind sidewalk in existing right away, a lot of that, uh, although this is really isn't a good example photo, but it does point out the, uh, what, the concept I'm referring to. Uh, even though that right of way behind the sidewalk may exist as, as public right of way for the city, it, these are people's front yards that we would be placing these signs in. And you know, in some cases, these residents have been maintaining these front yards for decades whatever, without even, <coughs> maybe even knowing that this right of way even existed, the public right of way existed. So when we looked at whether or not we could place the sign behind sidewalk, we looked at, uh, we actually knocked on residents' doors and, and asked for their concurrence to place the sign. In some cases, we got their concurrence and, and some signs were placed behind sidewalk. Uh, in other instances, we did not get that. Uh, in, in fact, in one particular instance, uh, we were not able to contact a homeowner, but the sign was properly placed uh, in a front yard, uh, and the next day the sign went missing. So our, our conclusion is that the resident may not have appreciated the sign being in their front yard. Um, so although unfortunate, uh, you know, we, we did the best we could with uh, what was out there. And, and really, again, going back to uh, placing that sign in the most conspicuous place that we could find. Accessibility is always, of course, uh, a consideration. Um, you know, whenever we look at, uh, whenever I look at projects from a, a signing and striping standpoint, and um, in, in this particular case, uh, placing the sign in the sidewalk does mean that we're we're taking a look at that pedestrian path of travel and making sure that we're adhering to all the uh, legal requirements that we need to. Uh, specifically, ADA re, uh, a law specifies a 36-inch um, path along ob, uh, be, uh, around obstructions. Um, the California Building Code, I believe, uh, requires uh, 48 inches. Uh, most of these sidewalks uh, were five feet wide, but that includes the curb and gutter, which is no longer allowed to be measured. Uh, so we're in an older part of town with existing facilities. Uh, and so we, we had to take a look at uh, several criteria to make sure we were maximizing all of those, uh, all, all those necessities. And in this case, uh, accessibility was absolutely considered and maximized to the uh, greatest extent possible. Part of the reason for having to reduce the right of way, uh, the, the path of travel at all, was because another criteria we need to conform to is making sure that those signs don't hang over the face of the curb. As you can see from the, uh, the red line, uh, we actually are violating another design policy which requires that these signs be six inches from curb face. These, these signs were installed at zero inches from curb face. So we did that because we knew accessibility is, is a, a very important concern for the city. 
And so we wanted to maximize that accessibility while still doing what we could to keep that sign out of the roadway. And even though we, we did that, um, we still have some rubbing that's occurring from our signs from vehicles hitting it. We think this was maybe a, a delivery truck that maybe have jumped the corner a little bit on that corner and just rubbed against the sign. So even though we, we uh, brought those signs as far over as we could, um, we're, they are still in danger of being hit and damaged by vehicles. The next thing I want to talk about um, is specifically the location and placement of the sharrows. The sharrows is a, a, a term being used for the shared line, lane markings. Again, uh, this is where we have installing class three bike lanes and um, are, are doing so to, pro to provide visibility and, and direction and guidance and warning to uh, roadway users that they need to share the road with bicyclists. So um, the, the presentation uh, from last council meeting showed uh, some, guidance, some guidelines, some EMTCDs, particular to the placement of these signs. And in this in particular is, is one instance where we absolutely did deviate from those design criteria, but we did so with uh, very specific reasons. Uh, the first reason is that uh, I really wanted that Shero, uh, even, even though the, the guidelines call for it to be in the middle of the vehicle lane, I actually like it to be underneath one of the tire tracks. And that's for um, a couple of reasons. One, it, it helps provide a tactile response as you're driving a, a vehicle. If you actually drive down any of the roads where these were installed, when you drive over this legend, you will feel it. You will, you will get that vibration. Uh, as if you drove over some raised pavement markers. Mm -hmm. And that's because we use thermal plastic, which is slightly thicker. And so you have that tactile response, which helps bring attention to these markings. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, in installing these markings throughout all of the roads uh, that were identified, uh, I'm not sure if we came across two cons uh, consecutive blocks where the street was the same width. So uh, because of that, uh, varying lane widths, you would expect these sharrows, if, if put in by design, would vary from distance from that, that yellow center line. So to help uh, improve the uniformity of its design, to help improve uh, the, the driver's eye as they travel down the corridor, and also to make it aesthetically pleasing, uh, all the sharrows were placed specifically from a distance from the center line. Um, and then uh, to hit on uh, design criteria of placing them no longer than 250 feet, like I stated earlier, when we removed some of the signs and uh, legends, we did so consciously uh, knowing that we were going to be um, going outside of the design criteria for this, uh, but that was because of how many we were installing and where we were installing them. Again, we're, we're going through neighborhoods where long stretches of streets where block after block we were installing these signs and legends. So although we didn't ins uh, install the legends every 250 feet, certainly as you drive down the road, you're not gonna just see one legend. You're gonna see multiple legends as you drive down those streets. So I feel very comfortable in reducing the number of legends and uh, increasing the distance, knowing that every block at the very least had one at the beginning and that the, um, uh, they were laid out consistently to co provide that constant reminder. Um, there was concerns about uh, the placement of the, the sharrows so close to parked cars. That's why these two photos in particular are presented here. Um, these photos show probably some of the burst, uh, uh, best and worst case scenarios. Uh, in that uh, the, the placement of the Shero may indicate that that's where the bicyclist is intended to ride their bike. And while they certainly can, that's not necessarily required by any kind of law or code or any recommendation other than the design guidance provided in MUTCD. Certainly the bicyclist is a vehicle on the roadway and treated as such by the vehicle code and so has equal opportunity to the entire length of, width of the roadway as the vehicle does. So although uh, we place the Sharos very specifically and in some cases are, are are very close to parked cars, um, that doesn't obligate the bicyclist to be specifically over the Shero. Uh, and certainly as a, a bicyclist and as a, uh, a driver of a vehicle, we all have a responsibility to use the roadway appropriately and look for each other as we're, we're entering and using and, and traveling down the facilities. So anyone who's parking their car opening door should be conscious of a vehicle of any kind, even a bicyclist approaching and do so appropriately. Likewise, a bicyclist seeing a parked car should be uh, pay attention and watch out for that uh, last minute car door opening. So uh, there's some shared responsibility uh, on all roadway users to make sure that we're all using these facilities properly. Um, and, and in the spots where uh, the sharrows are rather tight and very close to parked cars, um, we did take a look at whether or not we could prohibit parking. And if, certainly if the city council would like us to take a look at that, we can. Um, at this time, I don't think it's recommended because a lot of these places were 
Uh, those areas are tight. So is parking. Parking's a, a hot commodity, uh, especially in, in some of these areas of the city. So removing that parking would uh, require either affecting a resident or a business owner where parking may be at a premium. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk, out, uh, talk about is crosswalks and, and specifically uh, vehicle code 275, which has uh, been brought up several times, talks about prolongation of the sidewalk. Uh, the full text is included on this slide and prolongation is certainly one of the def defining characteristics of a crosswalk. But another defining characteristic is in that paragraph B, which talks about a crosswalk exists legally wherever it is marked. Um, and also that last paragraph, notwithstanding either of those paragraphs, uh, local authorities uh, have uh, the ability to prohibit crossings but must do so with signage. Uh, and this, this slide in particular not only comes in um, uh, context with this presentation, but also on the next item as well. Uh, and uh, just wanted to bring this up in, in uh, because it, it helps frame uh, some of the comments uh, referring to crosswalks. Uh, all of the crosswalks that were marked uh, as part of this project were done so um, with all of this taken into account with engineering judgment, with METCD and, and other rules and guidelines and, and requirements. And all of those crosswalks uh, uh, meet or exceed those, those criteria. Um, there was though, however, one location where uh, I noticed in the presentation uh, presented uh, that there, it does require some further explanation. And this is a location at the intersection of Chino and 14th. On the picture on the left is a, a picture from the sidewalk looking across the street. As I bring up the image, you'll see a red line appears. This red line would be where the, where the, the first line of the crosswalk would be installed if it were installed uh, connecting the ramps together. The problem with this is line of sight from the vehicle's perspective. Uh, and I, I want to mention that this location wasn't changed as part of the project, other than the addition of the bike lanes. The limit line, stop bar, and center line uh, all were repainted in place as how they were originally designed. And I think I have a good idea of why this design is the way it is. Um, as you can see in the red, uh, as you pull up the intersection, if you were to stop behind where this red mark is, when you look to the left and right, you have a very hard time uh, seeing oncoming traffic in both directions. So. Uh, the layout of the striping was such that now that we switch to the purple uh, line, uh, that is where the stop bar, are, uh, stop bar is. And then the pictures down below that appear now give you a clear line of sight of oncoming traffic on Chino. Uh, so although um, we might need to take a look at this intersection for further improvements in the future, um, certainly what was installed helps provide maximum uh, visibility for the vehicles at this location. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the removal of the signs, specifically a lot of the signs that were installed and, and removed. A um, couple of comments on this. Uh, the sign posts that were removed as part of this project, um, and this, the pictures I'm showing before are actually a couple of signs that were, were relocated after uh, inspection, um, were done so using standard practice by the city whenever we mo remove a, a sign post that's no longer necessary. So. Um, and one of the things I wanted to bring up was uh, the part of the specifications that was presented in the last presentation, and I underlined some, uh, a couple of key words that included that, that, uh, that uh, although the concrete is slated that if it's damaged, it, it needs to be removed by the contractor at the contractor's expense, that that damage needs to be identif identified by the city engineer, which in this case is, is act, it, our inspectors act as the engineer's eyes and ears in the field. Staff reviewed and approved each of the locations that were removed um, and repaired, and no panel was ever identified as having been damaged by uh, removal of the sign placement. Regardless of that, though, we do recognize that the, the repairs made by the signposts, and certainly the quantity of them, um, and the contrast of the concrete versus the existing, it does uh, present a, an aesthetically unpleasing result. And, uh, and I believe Maria will speak to uh, uh, the Public Works Department's uh, request this evening to go back and replace those panels if the council so desires. And uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. I'll hand it back to Maria. Yes, to reiterate, yeah, the, the signs that were removed, and they were mentioned by Dennis, they were removed at the direction of staff, and they were uh, repaired in the manner that the industry standard um, is utilized, not only in the city of Chino, but in other cities as well. Um, it, the removal part of it is consistent with industry standards. So although the result may 
not be aesthetically pleasing at some in some areas if council really wishes to direct public works staff to remove those panels and replace them, we can certainly do so. We still have a budget balance of about $14,000, um, and council can authorize us to direct CTNT to remove and replace the panels, if that's the wish. Um, it is staff recommendation that the council approves the staff report with the recommendations indicated, and this concludes our report, our, our report, and we will be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Maria. Uh, we have a written request to speak, and that'd be Stubby Barr. Let's go. Stubby left. Okay. Council comments? Questions? I have a couple of uh, comments. Mark. One is uh, I know that we talk about we paint these, these things on the ground, and some of them being so close to cars that it's a person's responsibility to one, look out for somebody else, and whether you're the bicyclist or the, the person in the car opening the car door. But the reality is, if people took that type of responsibility, then we probably wouldn't have 90% of lawsuits that we currently have, because we're always held responsible for somebody else's mistakes, whether it's that they hit a pothole, that they probably saw that they could have probably avoided that we now have to pay for, or if there's a crack on the sidewalk that they probably should have saw when they were walking but didn't and tripped and, and fell, and now the city's on the hook for it. My only concern is putting these things so close to cars, a person can sit there and say, well, I was following the bicycle lane that's painted on the sidewalk, and somebody opened the door, and I, and I hit it. My question to the city attorney would be, is this something that that we would be able to defend? Um, thank you, if I may, Madam Mayor. The, um, you know, the standard for creating what's called a dangerous condition of a public <laughs> improvement um, is that it has to be substantially dangerous. So the, the um, like the sidewalk example you, you commented on, um, typically there's actually a standard. It has to be lifted by over, I believe it's three quarters of an inch to even get, past, get to that standard. Otherwise the case gets thrown out. Um, it, here we're not even in that realm because I'm hearing from your traffic engineer that this, this is the markation of this particular um, Shero is not indicated to uh, show where the actual bike should bicycle should go so somebody uh, that is riding a bicycle should number one understand that um, they should use their own you know cautious practices and but it also demonstrates to the vehicles parking there that this is a shared roadway so as far as providing notice of this condition uh, certainly through these um, signs and the sharrows you're doing that there's nothing that I'm seeing here that it, where you're creating a dangerous condition. Uh, you're actually informing the public that um, this is a shared roadway. So unlike that sidewalk example where it's lifted and, and it could be lifted beyond what the law considers to be trivial, this, this is actually perfectly within the authority of, of the traffic engineer and using sound en engineering judgment from what I understand. Okay, and then my only other comment is uh, I mean, I'm not speaking for the for the entire council, but for myself, um, when we cut those signs off and we fixed them, it really made the sidewalk look awful. And I think uh, we gave the direction that we want to make sure that obviously whatever we do in the city, we, we're doing it to beautify the city. So it would be my request, and obviously we'll take a vote on it and, and determine if that's something that, that we want to do, but it would be my request to to change out those panels and um, return them back to the original state before we put the, the signs up. Would be my, that's my only comment. Okay. Karen? Turn on my, the comments, my comments are about the sharrows and the, the signs. Uh, I've, first of all, Dennis, thank you for that report, and Maria. Um, 
I probably read more about Sheros after reading the council agenda this weekend than I ever have in my life. <laughs> and as a former bicyclist, when you look at Sheros and what I think like, I always compare it to like the legislative intent of the law. Everything I could read about Sheros, Dennis, states that the, like the legislative purpose of this from a bicyclist perspective is to install these, not like a class three or two bike lane, but that these are installed along bike routes in order to specifically where you have an area like where the park car is and then the Shero, and then the Shero sh should provide, it doesn't have to, but it's a suggested path of the bike over the Shero. So I think we can reasonably agree that it's a suggested path that the bicyclists stay on the Shero. And the purpose for the Shero every for distancing is to tell the motorist who may be coming up on a slow moving bicyclist, hey, there's probably gonna be a bicyclist in front of you because generally speaking, this is a road that's too narrow to accommodate a parked car, the bicyclist here, and a car sharing the lane with it. All three can't fit in there. So while I do understand that from an engineering perspective, there probably is some reasonableness for you to move to offset the Shero. I think most bicyclists are gonna see the Shero and have a tendency to cycle over it because it's kind of an accepted language in the cycling world. You stay on the path, just like you would not leave the bike path, generally speaking, if it were striped. You're gonna stay within the boundary of the path. I, I have a hard time understanding. Um, I understand why you did it, but I'm, I share the same concern with, with Councilman, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Lucio, and that the sheriffs seem to be offset in some of these areas. And a lot of these areas that they're gonna be traveling through in this downtown area because the roads are so narrow that we may have, not purposely, but unintentionally, even though there's a shared responsibility there, put them so close to these parked cars that instead of a bicyclist having a tendency to, to take the roadway or, or, around a car, they, they may have a tendency to want to stay in the, in the share road area now. Um, because it, technically that's supposed to be their path. I, I, that's, 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 that's a hard part of this report that, that, I'm, that, I, that I have, as well as I do agree with Mayor Pertim's with Lucio's recommendation that we go and replace those panels if we took the, the sign off. You know, I, I used my own, my own litmus test there. If the city had come in and put that sign in there and removed it and left it unsightly and left a blemish there, I would, I would want them to fix it. I, I just ex extend my own expectation to the rest of the residents of Chino. I think they would appreciate it you know, for us to fix it. So I just wanted to open that up for if council's discussion on the Sheros, I, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know if we take them out. I don't know if we, it's prudent for us now to you know, discuss the idea of moving them so that we create a, 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 um, you know, a wider buffer. I think the idea of the Sheros is to create the appropriate buffer to protect them from you know, bicyclists from not just parked cars opening, but also cars that could be approaching them. And to piggyback off of what she said, I think maybe it might be a better idea just to put that Shero in the middle of that lane so that that one, the bicyclist knows he can ride in the middle of the street, which he should know anyway, but um, also let the drivers know that it's not wide enough for a bicycle and a car, so they may be very well following behind a bicycle. I just think that would be something that would be safer than, than putting it so close to the car. I think if it was more in the middle of that street, uh, then they would everybody would have an understanding that that's going to be a shared road. Okay, well, any comments? Well, a couple. Uh, thank you. Like... Um, uh, council person Comstock, I, I have never heard the word Cheryl before. If you ever asked me what that was, I would say, uh, I don't know, some kind of a bird or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as far as um, me riding a bicycle, um, I don't think that where that Cheryl would be placed on the street would have anything to do with where I, my bicycle would, I would ride my bicycle. And um, I think if we want to direct uh, the bicycle rider to ride in a certain part of the street, we need to put a lane there, a, a solid stripe, for them to 
to stay within. Otherwise, wherever we put that zero isn't, isn't going to affect where the bicycle rides, I, in, in my opinion. And um, I have to, um, as far as the panels, um, unfortunately, I, I think we, we should re, uh, replace those panels. Okay. Well, one direct, clear direction then is to remove the panels where there was a repair done and replace the whole panel. Uh, as far as the Cheryl's is concerned, Dennis, how many of them are placed like the top picture where it's very close to cars? How many would have to be moved to the left to be a safe distance away from open doors? That's a very good question. I, I don't have that exact answer. It's my guess is it's dozens. It's certainly not all of them. Um, the uh, examples like the photo shown in the, uh, the top there, uh, that's, that's not representative of the entire project. That's mostly right. very close to City Hall uh, area. Um, so um, certainly if, uh, if the direction is to, to do something about that, we certainly can. Um, but I, I can get you a, a number for that. And then I'll have to defer to Maria, but that might even be something we can have this existing contract do. I'm not sure. Or, or, or it might be something that we can have our um, public works maintenance do through their striping contract. Is it difficult to remove that product from the street? It does require uh, some significant removal process because it is thermoplastic that was installed. Uh, so in the removal process, there may be some scarring of the roadway that is that will remain. Um, but certainly relocating those sharrows is, is a is a possibility and can be done. Okay, Amr, do you have that information? Uh, Mayor, council member, uh, if I may, to to go back and we look at the shadows and replacement of that, uh, it, it's not as easy as just putting them in the middle of that lane. We'd have to go back with because this this project was engineered by by uh, by a civil engineer, and they looked at where the placement was. So for, for us to go back and change that, we have to relook at each hero, make sure it's in a safe spot. And we, we can definitely do that. That wasn't part of this project. This project was awarded, designed, awarded, built according to certain plans. So we do need to complete this process and get this thing over with. We can come back and provide you information on what it would take to move the shadows or if we should move the shadows. But without looking at, because we've already placed them where we believe it's safe. For us to move it, we have to make sure that we place them in another spot that's also safe. And we, we have a design engineer that has done this, this uh, design for this project, and we probably should consult them prior to making any changes to where they, where they told us to place the shadows. Well, if I understand the request from the council members, it would be to move the ones like you see in the upper photo to the left, uh, not in a different locate, totally different location, but shift it to the left away from the car doors. And, and that is what we will do. So what we will do is we'll look at all of them that are close to the car, and then we will look at how many are there, and then what process would be to get them to move them to the, to more to the center of the lane, is what my understanding is, that you would like to see them. OK, now, that, if that obviously is not part of the contract that was awarded, so it would either have to be a change order or the city would have to foot that bill, correct? Yes, the, the change order would still be upon us. We would have to put the bill. The, the, the process by which we would do it uh, is that we would close this project out, count the number of shadows that we would like to relocate, either put them out to bid or use our crews to do that. We have to take these ones off. We take them off, we slurry that area or whatever to hide the, uh, where the shadow was before, and then we move it over. Okay. But it cannot be done at the project. We're ready to close the project out. So going back with the change order is very difficult at this point. No, I understand. And it, and it was a grant, correct? It is a grant. And we have, uh, I believe, 14000 or so left in that grant. Uh, and we'll also look at see where we can get some money to supplement um, uh, fixing those uh, panels and then fixing shadows there. And then we, can, we can look at how many shadows are there, count them, and then, and then report back to council. OK, I'd like comments from both council members that would like to move them. Karen? Can part of the grant money be used to correct the replacement of the sharrows in the ceiling? Definitely can. If it can, I would really like to see us if study and move those sharrows. I know, um, to Walt's point, there's probably a lot of people that wouldn't affect where they ride the bike. But I had a conversation with the city manager today into to a lot of the bicycling world 
you know, particularly with the advent of electric bikes, I think you're going to see in the future more bikes on the road. You know, they're they're more affordable now, and when you when you to study the the intent of Sharos is for the bikes bike to ride over them, and those electronic bikes go faster than ever. They go 25 and 30 miles per hour, and they're really becoming quite popular in a lot of communities. So that would be my suggestion is for us to do some study. You know how to go out there and move the share to a safer location so that the cars know it's a shared path with the bike. But at the same time, not just marking up the rest of the city and making sure we patch it the right way and correct it in order to provide safe travel for the bicyclists, alert the drivers, and provide enough passage from opening doors for, for bikes. Mark? You know, it, to me, obviously, I'd like to see the, I'd see, like to see them moved more over to the middle of the street. If you look at the bottom picture, uh, even though the street is wider, uh, that, that Shero is literally right in the middle of the street. It's almost lined up directly with the with the stop sign that's painted on the on the ground as well. It's almost completely lined up with that. And when we go with a, with a more narrow street, we're actually moving it over more closer to a parked car. Where I think we should have probably just put that in the middle of the street, the same like we did on this this wider street. It just would make more sense. Um, I think it would be something that people would look at it and then they'd have a better understanding. Um, I mean, it, it's always been my belief and what I've experienced in life is, uh, you know, we change policy as a result of lawsuits. I mean, that's just the, the, the name of the game, unfortunately. Um, and I don't want it to come back later and as a result of us getting sued or maybe losing a civil suit that we end up moving them over anyway. So I would rather get a, ahead of this um, and take care of it before somebody utilizes this and then uses it as an excuse as why to, they, they got injured. Okay, I think what we're going to do then, um, staff did bring out the reason why they put it where they put it was so that the right tire of the vehicle would run over it. And if you look at both pictures, they're the approximate distance from where a right tire would be. So I think that's why they did it. But since it's clearly a request to the council to change these, um, I would like you to come back with the number that needs to be changed. And I would also like, now this is going to sound really weird, but I would like some kind of an artistic indication of what that street's going to look like. So that item is going to have to be removed and patched and then a new application put down. So you're not gonna have, the white lines are not gonna just move. There's gonna be a black patch and then white lines. So I want us to be very aware of what it's gonna look like after it's moved before we direct them to be moved. May, may I make a quick comment? Yes. So the, I, it, the way our city looks, is it's very important to council. They, you've made that abundantly clear to us at the, at the budget meeting. Um, part of this, these things with the panels, the issue is we, staff, we're trying to look for those things. We're removing the panels or the signs because they didn't look very nice. We right. did create another issue that had to do with the, with those little patches that we need to now remove the panels and fix them. It's similar case here. We're, you know, we are looking at the looks. The, the Dennis's presentation has made it abundantly clear that these shadows are in the safe spot. But if your preference is for us to move it, we'll move it. Right. We'll move it to anywhere you would like. But the patch will show. There will be, right. there will be a grinding of that, and then we'll come back and do a black patch that would be probably 10 by 10 or 10 by 12. And you'll see that, but then the, the, the shadow will be moved over. So right. we can do that so it looks pl look pleasant, but you'll still see the spot, and you'll see where, where it was before. No, I understand, Omar. I just want all of us up here to visually see what that will look like so that we accept it so we don't come back later and tell you I don't like the way it looked. Okay, I just, I'm trying to cross my T's and dot my I's. So please come back if it's okay with, with you too. Come back with the number that has to be removed and then do some kind of a, um, Dennis, you know what I mean, right? Like an overlay picture that shows us what that's gonna look like when it's correct. Well, okay. And then it is a direction to remove and replace the panels that had the cut and the change. Uh, may I ask a point of clarification? Yes. I, 
obviously the motion could be either approving this item with those directed changes or bringing it back. I, I do notice that item number three of the recommendation is to authorize staff to direct C, C T, and T to remove and replace. To remove the and replace. So yes. the, the question I think is with that, is that directive sufficient for staff to replace all the required panels? Okay, so it, it's built into the staff recommendation. Okay, now moving the Cheryl's is not. not. Okay, so that will have to be a separately funded item, correct? Yes, and a separate action by council. So all you're doing tonight is you're saying the contractor has completed their work. Hmm. And to remove and replace the panels. And you're also directing staff to move and replace the panels. We'll come back as a separate project. To First, we're going to verify whether or not the, the, the new locations are safe. Right. And if they are, what the costs are associated with removing the old and putting in the new. And what it looks like. And what it looks like. Because I want council to completely approve that change. That's Removing right. and replacing the panels is actually part of the staff report. Anyway, right. that's, and, we're and, okay on that. And just to be clear, that the remaining fourteen thousand dollars is going to go of the grant money is going towards the replacement of those panels. Right. This will be an additional cost and additional additional funding source that we yes. to move them. Right. Yeah. Okay. I well, think we're, 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 we're going to go ahead and pay the contractor. Well. Yeah. The, the panels he'll do with the change order. The moving of the Sheros is our responsibility because it's over and above what we directed the contractor to do and we're changing our mind. I believe the, the we're not doing the removal as a change order. We're closing the project out right. and we are using the city's current contractor to do the, the work. So it won't be a change order to this contract. Right, yeah. right. Okay. It's a new task. Yes, we're going to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, then I would entertain a motion. I have one more question, Mayor. I'm sorry. Yes. Do we think there's $14,000 worth of panels to be replaced? I think it's closer to $10,000. So can some of that money be used for the sheriffs as well? No, I think that I think it's going to be more than that. They have to come I'm going to come back with a number for you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. I will come back to us. Okay, then I would... Uh, Recommend a motion and a second for the direction that's been proven, provided. Okay, a motion from Councilman Person Comstocks, second from Mayor Pro Tem Lucio. Item passes four with one absent. Okay, item number 17, the Ward of Construction Contract ST 162 Phase 1. And TR 171, <clears throat> award a construction contract in the amount of $3,313,079.27 to Sequel Contractors Incorporated for construction of Project ST 162, Phase 1 Street Rehabilitation Project and TR 171, Traffic Signal Modification and Paving and Approve Associated Project Expenses. Staff reports will be once again provided by Maria Frazier, our CIP engineering manager, and Dennis Rawls, our transportation manager. Um, Madam Mayor and council members, the project in front of you tonight was presented by staff um, in a council meeting held on June, June 6th. Um, this project is one of the most crucial and important projects uh, for the city of Chino, as this area is, is a the focal point of this area is, sh is shopping for the city of Chino. The picture in front of you clearly shows the importance of the project, not only to the residents, but also to the business owners. It unmistakably shows the importance of the access to this area. During the meeting, some concerns were raised with regards to adding a fourth crossing at both intersections Grand and Spectrum East and Grand and Spectrum West. Dennis is going to go over the details uh, and the science behind the, the design decisions that were made for this project. With that, I'll, I'll be over Dennis. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Mayor and City Council, um, 
one of my passions is traffic signals. It's probably why I became a traffic engineer and, and one of the things that's near and dear to my heart and, and certainly making them work for the conditions in which we, we find ourselves in is one of the challenges I enjoy solving. Um, with that, you know, we're here tonight to talk about um, adding additional pedestrian crossings to the Spectrum West and Spectrum East intersections along Grand Avenue. Uh, that would be the, to add these uh, pedestrian ramps highlighted in red. Uh, one of the other aspects of this project is to take a look at the Grand and Roswell uh, Avenue intersection, which is also the northbound 71 uh, exit. Uh, there are two existing crossings here, one crossing Roswell on the north side of the intersection and another one crossing the, the east leg of the intersection. Uh, that crossing along the east leg of the intersection is very atypical. Uh, typically, corner to corner is, is how those intersections are, are crossings are aligned. Uh, but in this particular case, because of some of the roadway geometries that were there, and, and I believe to help reduce the amount of time it takes for a person to cross the street, the pedestrian crossing here was uh, installed in such a manner uh, that it, it provides some confusion to some of the roadway users. Um, and in particular, uh, sometimes what happens is uh, because of this design, vehicles often mistakenly misinterpret where, they, where to stop and occasionally end up stopping beyond uh, the crosswalk while still believing they're in the middle of the intersection, uh, sometimes even blocking the, the existing crosswalk. Um, so uh, for these reasons, uh, staff is looking into uh, the potential of removing this crosswalk. Uh, that comes with uh, a lot of complications in this particular location. Uh, one, uh, by law, we have to do a public notice for 30 days uh, at the site, um, informing the public that uh, there is an intention to remove that crosswalk. Uh, but also, um, there's some, and we've been in contact with Caltrans already because there would be a shared partner in this is this venture, um, and uh, staff that we've contacted so far is resistant to make a change here, um, stating that well, it's existed so long in this configuration without issue, why change it? Um, but as stated, it's it's definitely something we're taking a look at, um, and uh, I think the recommendation tonight includes moving forward with the removal, but as stated, there's a process involved, and that process will take time. As, uh, if approved tonight, uh, even though that might uh, start us along getting this project approved, uh, certainly we'd like, um, as part of your recommendation, to, to uh, move forward with removing this crosswalk. Um, and if we um, find ourselves in a position where we cannot, that can simply just be deleted from the project. It'd be harder to not include it and try to include it later as a change order. So I uh, just want to talk about that for a moment. Going back to the Spectrum West and Spectrum East intersections. Dennis, excuse me, before you move on. Sure. Has any kind of traffic count on pedestrians been done at that location? At Roswell, yes. Mm -hmm. I can check to see if I have the numbers in front of me. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I do have those numbers. I just don't know if I have them in front of me. But yes, there is, there is a recent count. It was done in 2018, right before the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, really kicked off. Uh, it was part of the count for the entire corridor uh, that um, uh, helped us with retiming the signals and providing the coordination synchronization that currently exists out there. But you don't have the number with you now? I don't believe so, but I'll, I'll double check. Okay. I might. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so speaking of counts, one thing I wanted to point out is, in fact, that we are still in a pandemic. So although we are recovering from that and traffic is returning to normal, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Uh, the graph in front of you right now represents uh, two uh, moment in time counts of average daily traffic. It's represented in uh, hourly counts. The line in yellow uh, was a count taken in 2016 as part of our citywide uh, average daily traffic count of this corridor. Uh, the, the bars in blue uh, represent counts that were recently taken uh, back in May, in fact, um, as part of our updated ADT counts that we were scheduled to do this year. Unfortunately, like I said, obviously the pandemic is still in effect and has still had an impact on traffic volumes. So we haven't quite reached the level of, of traffic we had five years ago even. Um, but this graph, uh, this graph also represents uh, the amount of percentage of traffic, truck traffic, that also uses the corridor. Uh, which in my opinion is, is very significant. Typically, we just do a flat 2% um, truck traffic uh, as, a, as a, just a general rule. Uh, in some cases, the peak hour volumes get close to 10% uh, 
uh, or maybe closer to five, yeah, closer to ten percent of the total number of traffic uh, used using Grand Boulevard. In comparison, um, as I mentioned back in 2018, we did do some turning movement counts and pedestrian counts for coordinating the traffic signals. Uh, the, the graph that's now overlaid shows how many times pedestrian crossings were activated at both the Spectrum West and Spectrum East uh, when we took those counts. Uh, the darker blue and orange bars represent uh, the total amount of activations of the crosswalk, while the lighter colors, uh, bars adjacent to those, represent only the times the crosswalks were activated to cross Grand Boulevard. Uh, one thing in particular I want to point out that the maximum that occurred was six times in an hour, um, as represented by the, the light blue bar here uh, at Spectrum uh, West. Um, in looking at the project and, and the consideration of adding the pedestrian crossing, uh, I think I've, I've talked to a couple, uh, uh, a council member and, and Madam Mayor uh, previously about um, my concerns with adding the pedestrian crossing here. And those concerns uh, I want to illustrate today, part of it is that Grand Avenue is the third busiest street in the city. Uh, only Euclid Avenue and Central near the 60 freeway are busier than, Euclid Ave uh, than Grand Avenue. Uh, Grand Avenue's an eight lane major arterial uh, and, and a designated truck route. And it's, it's a key economic corridor for the city and, and provides access to the 71, which is part of the reason why adding this crosswalk here and, and the pet activations that would result of it would have an impact on how it operates. Uh, this leg, uh, where the pedestrian crossing is, is being looked at and discussed today, uh, is the highest volume leg, uh, meaning that the traffic coming into and exiting the, the shopping center, the majority of that traffic wishes to either go towards or comes from the 71. Uh, and in fact, that's, that's even more prevalent by the fact that uh, on the, the southern side of the intersection, um, we actually combine um, this lane here as a second left turn lane because we have so much traffic exiting and going towards the 71. Uh, and in adding that pedestrian crossing, um, it does per, uh, potentially uh, expose the uh, pedestrian to greater risk when they cross that, as that is the highest volume leg. Um, notwithstanding that, taking a look at the, uh, how the impacts of both the pedestrian crossing and vehicles might use the corridor and how this would change how both groups would use this corridor, uh, took a look and did some analysis and took a look that uh, of those six pedestrian crossings that cross Grand Avenue, they would experience about a three minute uh, improvement in getting from one side of, of the street to the other if their destination was on, along that west side of the street. In contrast, uh, the peak amount of vehicle traffic in an hour was 2,500 vehicles in that 2016 number uh, in that graph I showed previously. Each of those would ex vehicles would be expected to uh, experience an increase of one minute of delay as they tried to pass through the corridor uh, when a pedestrian was activated uh, along this uh, crossing. Uh, that delay it, it lends itself to increased gas usage and increased emissions as those vehicles sit idle uh, waiting for their turn. Um, but I would have wanted to get into, and, and please Forgive me, it's, it's gonna get quite technical here, but uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a big fan of traffic signals, and I wanted to really help uh, illustrate why adding that pedestrian crossing has an impact to the intersection when it is used. And so I wanna take you through how the current traffic signal actually functions today. Uh, currently, when the signal rotates around its cycle, uh, it takes about two minutes to do so. So from the moment these left turns turn green to the next time they turn green, there's a two minute clock that operates in the traffic signal currently. So right now the left turns uh, along Grand Avenue are allowed to operate um, either with each other or you know, as on demand. After that, of course, the Grand Avenue traffic along that eight lanes of traffic uh, activates and turns green, allowing for traffic along Grand Avenue to travel both east eastbound and westbound and allows for easier access into the shopping center with those right turns. Concurrently with those movements, the pedestrian crossings shown here on blue with blue dotted arrows uh, would activate if a pedestrian was there to cross. As we move to the operation of the traffic signal uh, exiting and entering the shopping center, we've got a slightly different operation. Um, first, the uh, southern side of the intersection would turn green, allowing both those lanes of traffic to exit the shopping center. 
as I mentioned earlier, that heavy movement requires that both those lanes be used for left turn purposes. Uh, and that pedestrian movement uh, would go along with that. Uh, this is uh, actually lends itself uh, perfectly for how it currently operates as the amount of time, green time needed to clear the exit at this location is very close to the amount of time we are required to give a pedestrian to cross the street here. Uh, so uh, having this turn green for as long as we need a pedestrian here uh, represents very little impact to the rest of the vehicle public and, and really doesn't reduce much delay there. But this operation is what we call split phase. We split the phasing of the intersection so that one direction goes and then another. And we do that specifically uh, because of this particular configuration on this other lane. Because we have to have the left turn and through movement share the same lane, we cannot have the left turns go separately um, uh, from, from both sides. So we have to split those up and allow the northbound to move and then the southbound to move. So uh, currently, because the majority of traffic, again, exiting the shopping center wishes to travel towards the 71, uh, on the north side of the intersection, the major volume of movement makes the right turn. Now, unlike the southern section, which requires the green light in order to, to enter the intersection, the right doesn't necessarily need that. They're allowed to make a right on red. Uh, specifically, while this eastbound left turn is moving, uh, there is no conflict that prevents that right turn from moving. Because of that, and because of the, the slightly lesser volumes on the north side from the south side, we don't require as much green time um, in, that, in that cycle uh, to the north side. However, if we were to add this pedestrian crossing across this leg, now we have to, uh, without any improvements, um, allow for enough time in that program to make sure that we provide uh, sufficient clearance for this pedestrian phase. That amount of time equates to about a 20 second increase in the amount of green time over and above what's necessary for the vehicle traffic exiting the, sh exiting the shopping center. It's for these reasons that uh, the impacts are felt because while that pedestrian is clearing that intersection, we've already cleared out the majority, if not all of the traffic coming out of the north side and still waiting the additional 20 seconds while none of the other movements are able to now go. Uh, so that creates uh, a an increased delay in all of the other movements uh, that I'll illustrate more later. So what if we change uh, the way it's configured? What if we <coughs> add some improvements? So what if we add an additional lane coming out on the south side there? Well, the operation on ground would remain much the same way. Left turns would go, through movements would go with their ped phases. But now when we get to moving uh, traffic into and out of the shopping center, we're able to operate it differently. There'd be no more split phase and we'd allow the left turns to go on concurrently. Um, keeping in mind though, that we'd still have to maintain the dual left turns because of the high volume. And that, that left turn movement would still require near the same amount of time to clear that intersection and, and get all those cars out of the shopping center. The next phase that would occur was, would be now that the, now both sides of the intersection, both northbound and southbound, would turn green, and now both pedestrian movements would turn on with each other and go concurrently. This does help the situation, however, it still doesn't solve it, and there are still impacts felt, as again, um, the amount of vehicles wishing to go through and making a right, uh, the green time required for that still would be far less than what would be required for the pedestrian movement. So I wanted to give you a sense of what uh, the impact and the magnitude of those impacts um, might be. So this graph represents um, the amount of delay in seconds. That's, that's your vertical axis there. That's the numbers here. The amount of average delay um, that would be experienced by, the, by each of these directions uh, during uh, a peak hour. Uh, the current green bars, uh, and I have split them up by Spectrum West over here and Spectrum East over on the right. The green bars represent the current existing condition. That's the signals as they are programmed today without the pedestrian movement. And, and for a busy uh, corridor such as this, this is fairly typical. Um, the level of service for most of these movements range from a, a level of service C to a level of service E. Uh, the E being right around this southbound movement at Spectrum East, which does experience a, 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 a rather large delay. But as I said again, that, that's also the direction that gets the least amount of time because of the vehicle movements. So if we were simply to only add the pedestrian crossing um, and, and modify the signal timing to allow for that uh, without doing any improvements, when that pedestrian movement was activated, we would now see a dramatic increase in some of the delays um, in some of these movements. 
specifically on Grand Avenue, both eastbound and westbound at both intersections. But northbound would also experience a slight uh, increase in delay. Uh, that would be because as the southbound movements was allowed to stay on green longer, as I mentioned, that two minute cycle, um, uh, you know, that time is only finite. And so that amount of time would have to be reallocated to that southbound movement, taken away from the other movements. So we would balance that out based on traffic volumes, and these would be the resulting impacts. But if we provide the full improvements, we widened the, the shopping center exits, and we retimed and optimized the signals. Now we're looking at slightly improved uh, uh, average increases in delay uh, on Grand Avenue, uh, but we're still seeing a significant increase in delay uh, for cars exiting the southern side of the, of the, the shopping center. And again, uh, also an increase uh, in level of service um, on the uh, traffic on the north side. So even with the improvements, we would still expect to see that there would be some uh, reallocation that signal timing and, and that amount of pedestrian timing uh, required to make that southbound crossing across that west leg would have an impact on how the rest of the corridor functions. And when we program traffic signals, the way they operate, when they go into coordination, we set that cycle timer, that two minutes timer, or whatever that, two, that duration is. We can certainly increase that duration, but that, that duration still has to be allocated to all these locations and done proportionately. So while we may increase the cycle, you're still going to have some kind of impact because again, over the duration of an hour, you're still only getting so many cars through each time. Excuse me. And um, I think that was my only point there. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up um, as part of uh, council's information as they go to make a decision on this item before you. So in conclusion, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, adding that pedestrian crossing. Uh, like I stated in the previous presentation, is not necessary. There's no legal requirement to add that pedestrian crossing. And certainly, uh, it, would, it has the potential to increase risk to pedestrians by adding a crossing to a side that has the greatest amount of volume crossing it. Um, there are currently safe and convenient alternatives that exist in terms of the eastern crossing. Um, uh, from a traffic standpoint, I do not feel that there's enough pedestrians out there currently to warrant making the improvement. And making the improvement uh, would have a negative impact on the, on the, by increasing the delay on the rest of the corridor namely the cars moving along Grand and exiting the south side of the uh, Spectrum <coughs> Shopping Center. Um, and um, that any modifications would be pretty significant, requiring modifications to the exit and modifications to the traffic signal. And with that, that in, in concludes my part of the presentation and I'll, I'll hand it back to Maria to conclude. Well, I just wanted to summarize the staff has worked very hard in providing a design that fosters access that is not only safe, but also promotes increased levels of walkability, and therefore reducing pedestrian fatalities and, and injuries, um, as stipulated by the CBC 21949C that has been brought up before us before. Um, staff obviously has had a, time, a minute to evaluate the opportunity of adding that west leg to both Spectrum East and West. And if council chooses to authorize the design and construction of the additional, these additional two crossings, staff can, um, can do so. Um, the cost will be approximately 150,000 for the construction, for the design and the construction of the additional ramps. And in addition to that, we would uh, monitor these improvements for about six months and make any changes or adjustments that we would need to, to do. We will also recommend a study that will allow us to identify what the traffic impacts are uh, to the entire corridor. And that's about another $150,000 to get that study completed. Um, it is our recommendation that the council approves the staff report with the recommendations indicated. And uh, this concludes our report and we'll be happy to answer any additional questions. Okay, thank you. Um, this isn't a public hearing, but is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council on this item? Okay, seeing none, then council comments. Dennis and Maria, I wanna thank you for that report. 
uh, very thorough. In fact, I visited that site with you. I, I do want to state that I recognize the urgent need to get this area of the city repaved. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I've crossed in that intersection several times because I live like about a quarter mile away from there. And I think it's, you know, I've been there sitting in the in and out line and seeing several people have to make that three-legged cross, which was some of the concerns I originally stated when this was brought on May 4th. It's um, when you're standing out there as a pedestrian, I think three minutes is a, is a long time to, to, to gain when you're out there trying to, to cross any use, especially if you want to get to the other side. And I had explained to the city manager, I've actually seen bicyclists, even though they can ride straight across, actually go the opposite direction and then cross. And then inherently, there's also quite a bit written about people really resisting crossing in three ways to go one. They don't want to cross in a U when they see that the most direct route is across. So I think this presentation is good tonight as to why we shouldn't add the, uh, the, 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 cross, the, the crossing section without the geometric study. But as we move forward, I think you're going to see more people down there. I think we already have seen more people crossing down there. It's a car-centric shopping center. But in the future, I think more people are going to cross that way. And, and the way we've done it, I've seen plenty of people cross, especially this bicyclist, and then they don't re, reallocate, uh, reorient to themselves. They go actually into the southbound, I'm sorry, the northbound traffic coming out and reorienting themselves at a different time, which I think is dangerous because of how they have to cross there. So if staff's recommendation is it's not safe and you know, creates this, I would like to see us to conduct the study in future preparation because I talked about this as an, inter you know, an intersection that's important to us and we're going to live with it for a long time. And in addition to I would like to see us conduct a study for the intersection and, and work with Caltrans to improve that intersection. Uh, we, we recognize that the cars are not stopping there appropriately and that that crossing there is serving us no, no, no purpose as well as I, I passed it today uh, on my way to lunch in Chino Hills. It was completely blocked with cars because of how it's designed. So it, again, that was my concern that I shared on May 4th as well is that the the intersection there is is in, you know is is not serving us properly moving forward. So the two issues are I think the study moving forward in order to get that additional crossing, and then the the correction of the intersection, and how staff recommends we do that. I would you know I would be supportive of. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, Madam Mayor, if I if I may. Yes, Dennis. I do actually do have counts for uh, that intersection. Okay. Um, I actually have two sets of counts. One was taken uh, on a Thursday in August, in April of 2018. The other on a Saturday in April in 2018. Um, we had a, during a two hour period, well, yeah, we had a maximum of 14 crossings. Uh, and during both those times, not a single one was recorded crossing uh, Grand Avenue. So, so they crossed Roswell, but not Grand? Correct. Now, I, I can't speak as to why that is specifically. Uh, I've been out there um, in preparation of this project studying it, and I've seen pedestrians cross there, uh, Grand Avenue. Mm -hmm. But on, on these particular cases, on this one day, these two days, uh, back in 2018, during the peak hours, uh, no pedestrians were seen ex uh, crossing that East Leg. Okay, just Roswell, not Grand. Correct. Now, okay, I need a little bit of clarification. When you say Spectrum East and Spectrum West, are you talking about the, God, i got to get oriented, the East-West crossing, or are you talking about North-South north Ground south. Avenue? It's North-South. When you say Spectrum East, which, what is that? Are you addressing the whole intersection or just... Do you know, understand what I mean? Yes, the Spectrum East is the in and out intersection. Right, but, but when you say when you say Spectrum East, you're just talking about all three of those crosswalks? Or are you that talking about just the whole intersection period? Okay, correct. All right. Yeah, the intersection currently shown uh, under the green boxes. Okay. And but, Spectrum West, the one under So blue. your counts, if someone is just crossing um, 
not Grand Avenue, but in front of either side of Grand Avenue, the shopping center itself, um, your pedestrian count is only the count that's going across Grand? Yes, but that count is on both sides, both crossing the north half and, and the southern half. You want to go back to that pedestrian? But, but Dennis, I think for clarification, what the mayor's asking, and if you're standing on the corner of, of Grand and Roswell, there's chances are that there's some people that don't know the crossing's there because of where it's at, and it's covered, right? So it would explain why somebody wouldn't cross there. And quite frankly, if you tried to cross there, it, it's, it's risky. I mean, it's, again, I'm, I'm over there, and that's not a place I would cross. I would probably go to a, another location to cross. You know, furthering my point, when you walk down, like if you were walking eastbound, because you don't want to really want to cross there at Highway 71, right, because of the danger involved, so if you're on the north side of the street and you walk down and you want to go to the opposite side of the street, you can't cross at the first intersection because we don't allow it. So you have to make a U-turn and go back, right, because you don't really want to cross there. So you're literally kind of making a U-turn in that way, which is, was my point in all this to begin with. You don't really want to cross the Highway 71 in Roswell because of how it's designed. So now you go to the first intersection, you have to go across again and cross in a U to come back when we talked about that. So it's that's why I think it would be beneficial for us to evaluate in the future for Spectrum East and West because of even how 71 and Roswell is. Both and Dennis, uh, to look at this and actually watch the traffic. And at Roswell, it is very confusing. Um, but I, the problem that I have with completely removing the crosswalk at Roswell is if someone wants to get from the north side, am I turned around or am I okay? I, the north side, and they want to go to, say, the Olive Garden, they're not going to go all the way down to right there to cross to go back up to the Olive Garden if they're on foot or if they're on bicycle, you know? Um, so the only suggestion that I had on that is if we keep the crosswalk where it is, if Caltrans does not want to remove it and we keep it, that we change the signage and make it very, very, very obvious um, where you cross and where the cars should stop. Because it's a little confusing when, you're, when you travel east, west, when you travel that direction and you stop right there, but yet the intersection is clear up here. It gets a little confusing. So I think our, our marks on the pavement need to be a lot cleaner. And the signage there where they have to stop at a red light needs to be a lot clearer because it really isn't clear. Dennis, I pointed that out. We talked about that. It isn't clear, Marin, and I agree with you 100%, which is why I spoke to Dennis about that. In fact, the reconfigure that was why I suggested the reconfiguration is work with Caltrans to reconfigure that intersection. I suppose another potential if we could get Caltrans to cooperate is to create a landing in the center of that median, potentially. But then you know, again, you're you're delaying the pedestrian. You know, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're on your foot in in the street and you're waiting an additional three or four minutes, it can get frustrating for pedestrians, and that's when they'll start, you know, taking risks to get across the street. Well, I understand, so, but yeah. the, the problem also that we have with all of this, Karen, is is we're talking about peak hour of six people or ten people, and we're talking about thousands of cars, right? You know, and and the backup of traffic if we change the the yeah. timing, and that's super dangerous. Also, I would rather do what's safer for the pedestrian, you know, rather than endanger them by changing a bunch of stuff and then have irate drivers that turn anyway or, or whatever, but we're, we're impacting thousands of cars versus, what was it, 10 people at a peak hour, which, yeah, waiting an extra couple of minutes would be very aggravating if you're on foot, um, but you also don't want to get hit, and you don't want thousands of drivers in these gi great big gigantic trucks that are delivering materials and stuff also backing way back up to the next intersection either. It's complicated. Yeah, I just, if there's a way for staff to study it, and you know, my, I, I don't want to delay the cars any further, Mayor, but I also don't want to keep people waiting or crossing in a, in a horseshoe because we do it almost in every intersection down there, and I think that's frustrating to people. And it, like I said, orients people into the wrong direction of traffic. I've, I've seen it happen more than once down there with a the bicyclist. 
um, I think it's worthy of studying and seeing if we can get you know, quicker access for people when they are crossing down there. And I think we can expect to see more people crossing down there, you know, as our city continues to grow and, you know, more people walk. Well, let's get the rest of the comments. Mark, do you have comments? No, I mean, I agree with both of you on, on the crosswalk there as well. Just the way that intersection set up, I mean, it, you'll always find cars that are going to be past the limit line because it's just the limit line is so far back that I guess the cars, it doesn't make sense that they're going to be sitting so far back when there's still room that they can move up. And I, and I really don't know what we can do to make that crosswalk any better. I mean, I guess we could paint a crosswalk, a yellow one, to so that drivers know that that is actually a crosswalk and not a place where they should be stopping. Um, but that's that's it's, it's just really a difficult uh, area right there, just because it is. I mean, you you have those cars coming off the 71 freeway, and you know they're making that right hand turn, and you know if it's not clearly, if it's not clear to them that that's a crosswalk, then you run the danger of people when they're crossing there to get hit. And then if you really don't lay out the crosswalk, you're going to have people driving over that and going all the way up to. the basically almost to the intersection of uh, Roswell and, and Grand because, because they can at the end of the day. They're going to try to move as, as close as they can to, to the 71 freeway when, the, when they're stopped at a light. So it's just something that, that we're going to, you guys as engineers, you're going to have to come up with to, to make that crosswalk more visible because right now, I, I think that's a very under underutilized crosswalk just because I think people recognize that as being pretty dangerous. I think most people that go down there too are not on foot and they're not on bicycle. There are some obviously, but most people that go to that whole shopping center are in cars. Uh, Malt, you have any question or questions uh, or comments? A couple comments, yeah, thank you. Um, as far as the Roswell intersection, I'm thinking we just sign it up somehow, and like Mark said, and make sure uh, it's obvious. You can't miss it. Um, and because we need, I think we need that crosswalk there. And as far as uh, the extra side crosswalks at, at Spectrum East and Spectrum West, is that the name of the street, Spectrum? East. Oh, it's yeah. the shopping center names. Um, on the on the west side of both of, on, on on Spectrum East and Spectrum West, both of those streets, on the north side of Grand, do not have a sidewalk on the west side. So if you're walking from south side of Grand, north across this brand new side uh, crosswalk we're talking about, when you arrive at the north side of Grand you have nowhere to go because there's no sidewalk there. So I, I feel we don't need, uh, and I agree with uh, the staff that uh, we, uh, I feel we don't need to tie up the traffic just for that extra uh, couple of crosswalks there. The traffic, the traffic uh, impact would be really bad. And, um, and there's no, it's a crosswalk to nowhere, both of them, so I don't think we need those two crosswalks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the recommendation is to award the current construction contract, authorize certain expenditures, approve agreement, Geotechnical service surprise. Alternate direction to staff to add additional pedestrian crossing leg to Spectrum East and West. Okay. Um, after I visited the site, watched the traffic, looked at the complications, heard the problems with the timing and how it would impact the traffic, saw the traffic count. Um, at this time, I understand your concerns with, with not going three crosswalks, but I don't think we should add an additional crosswalk at this time. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's safe. I think we're not even back up to peak traffic yet, and that traffic backs up pretty, pretty bad. I think we should be concerned with pedestrian safety 
as well as the thousands of cars that go through that. So I think when it, I think our signage for this leg that doesn't have a crosswalk is poor. I think the signage needs to be improved that you cannot cross there. I think the ramps should be changed so that it's purely directional where you would cross going, yeah, I'm so bad at directions, going across like where in and out is and then across this way, but no ramps to cross both these ways. Um, I don't know if we can put a danger sign up there or not. You know, I have no ideas on the legalities of that. To do a study means we can't do anything to Grand Avenue and it's deteriorating. That pavement's in pretty bad shape. And we talked at length about our image and our streets falling apart. You know, we've got to, you know, get things better. And Grand Avenue, I drove it the other day and I was appalled. I came from Chino Hills actually down that way and that street is in bad shape. And it's continue, gonna continue to deteriorate. You asked for a study, Karen, the study, what kind of study is it that you would like to see and what is the timing of the study that you want? Well, Mayor, I, th I think one of the things that came up um, in a previous concern is, like I said, the, the crossing there. Um, crossing at So Roswell? if you, if you uh, or are you talking? No, 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 not, we're talking about spectrum, spectrum. west or east. Okay. And while I recognize um, um, what Mr. Polk, uh, Council Member Pocock is saying, hey, yeah, there's not a sidewalk over there by the other side of Mimi's Cafe, but if you're coming from the intersection of Grand and Roswell, eastbound and you get to this intersection, you have to cross in this this U-turn here. And what, what I think we should yeah, look... You know, show me the U-turn. What are you talking so about? So if you're, you're at, if you're at Grand and Roswell right. up here and you come eastbound, right. when you get here, you can't cross to go to this, this right. restaurant here. You have to cross here, 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 and this way. Right. And I've seen bicyclists do this and ride in here and, you know, don't, they don't reorient re, uh, themselves. They come into the southbound lanes. That's what I... I was hoping we could look to do is get you know, additional pedestrian orientation here so they're not constantly crossing in a U-turn. While I realize we can't do that today based off of what Dennis is saying, I was hoping we could conduct a study to see if we could get some of that additional right away and in the future potentially look at adding you know, you know, that, that pedestrian access. Because it is, if you're over there, you're crossing in, in a horseshoe right. you know, you know, a few different ways. And I realize we're only talking you said like a few pedestrians per hour, but if you're the pedestrian out there having to do that, it, it's 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 pretty frustrating to have to cross that way. And all I'm saying is if, if we could spend the money to conduct the study to see what we could do, then in the future we could potentially add this if we got the right of way. And that's one thing that I did talk to the city manager about as well, is if we could access that. But Well, I think we talked at length, because the in and out intersection right there is a mess. I mean, in and out is extremely popular. Um, they insisted on being at that corner, and there's been many times I've been in that shopping center, and it's hard to get out through that exit. So we had talked about it. I had asked Matt and Dennis, and someday it may end up being completely reworked mm -hmm. with the cooperation of the shopping center where that whole area right there might be reworked, but that may be years from now. So... Can, let me ask staff this question. Can a study be done? Can this project move forward, get these improvements, get the streets fixed, clarify signage, um, stop the deterioration of Grand Avenue, and then a separate project on a study for the future done to see if those intersections can be reworked or should be reworked in conjunction with the shopping center? Yes. Yeah. So you can go ahead and approve the project. I'd recommend a second motion to go ahead and move forward with the study. And that study's gonna show the outcome. It's gonna study the corridor, but it's also gonna take a look at the future improvements. If you wanna go back to that slide that shows um, the three lanes exiting Spectrum East. So what it'll study is this scenario where you had the flashing third lane yeah, it'll take back. a look at that whole intersection, and it'll, yeah. that study would provide the basically the layout of that intersection if we were to go to that phase in the future. Which would take right away 
and cooperation of the shopping center to change that whole flow. Correct? We would have to coordinate with the shopping center because that's on their right. property. It's on their and, property. And, and quite frankly, it would go a little even further south because we'd have to configure some of the the, the roadways and in coming into that intersection. Storm drains and that sort of stuff. Yeah, but right. but yes, that, that when, when we talk about that study, it's going to look at the corridor, but it's also going to look at in the future if we wanted to do these improvements, what would need to occur? Okay. I would just like to add, Mayor, I think it would be good for us to consider it with constructing for the future in mind. I mean, I, I understand what staff is saying for the present, but you know, there, you know, there may be the, the businesses and other things, and, and you know, equally moving people and cars, I think, is important to us in the future. We should give consideration to both. Okay. Then with council concurrence, I would entertain a motion to move forward with the current project um, at this time not providing additional pedestrian crossing but adding the item to conduct a study for future improvements of spectrum east and west intersections for possible improvements that would assist pedestrians and traffic. I think that's a good recommendation, Mary. I don't think I have clarification how we're leaving Grand and Roswell, though. Oh, no, we haven't clarified that. But I, I, um, I think that's a good recommendation. My personal recommendation on Roswell is to leave the crosswalk, to change the lighting, make a right-hand turn only not allowed, you know, not, um, no right turn on red, um, Clarify this the crosswalk with our bright demarcation like we do now. Um, change that signal so that it's obvious people have to stop where that sidewalk is. You know how you have that limit line. And no right-hand turn on red. I think that would stop people from going over the sidewalk. Um, I think that would help tremendously. Mayor, if I may, I, if the, I think the council just needs to decide whether or not you want a crosswalk at that location, and I would encourage uh, the council to have our uh, engineers design it um, so that it, okay. it meets the safety standards rather than try to, to design it. Uh, okay, then let's take a poll. I personally would like to keep the sidewalk there because I don't think people are going to walk all the way down and cross and come all the way back, back up to Olive Garden. So, Mark? Uh, I'd say keep the sidewalk there. The crosswalk. Crosswalk. Karen? I agree because to my point, if we don't change it right now, you have to walk on a U-turn just to get back. So. Walt? Hmm? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we'll keep the crosswalk. Okay. Uh, I believe the no red, no turn on red light is already there. And signs. Is it? Okay. Okay. Then we have a motion with modifications in front of us. I would entertain a motion in a second. Okay, there's a motion from Councilperson Comstock, second from Mayor Pro Tem Lucio, and the item passes four with one absent. So can I just repeat back to the council? So we're going to keep the crosswalk at Roswell. Yes. And in, in addition to awarding this project, and then we're also going to um, do a study at the intersections, the, the traffic study, the, the corridor, and the future construction of those intersections that we so choose mo to yes. move forward. Separate study. Okay. Yes. Thank you. But huh. I think, just to clarify, we're going to keep the, the crosswalk on Roswell, but you guys are going to design it to where it's a little bit more, at least noticeable yeah, I get an to people that it's... stamp on that. Okay. Yep. All right. I've already got several ideas. <laughs> okay. Um, next, under new business, item number 18, award of construction contract, off-site dual six-foot Diameter brine line discharge line, east side water treatment facility expansion project WA 19C, award a cons construction contract in the amount of $3,331,270, no, $3,331,276 to North Star Plumbing and Engineering Incorporated for construction of the offsite dual six foot diameter brine disposal pipeline for the Eastside Water Treatment Facility, WA19C, 
and approve associated project expenses. Our staff report this evening will be provided by our Director of Public Works, Amr Jocker. Mayor Council Member, tonight's item <clears throat> is to consider awarding construction contract to North Star Plumbing and Engineering for the Brine, line, brine Disposal Pipeline portion of Eastside Treatment Plant expansion project. The expansion of the Eastside Treatment Plant is currently in progress. Brine is a, bright pro uh, is a byproduct of the groundwater treatment process, which cannot be discharged into the sewer system due to the high salt content. We're currently hauling off the brine waste which is expensive and is not feasible when the plant is expanded. Uh, the brine disposal pipeline is over a mile and a half long and ties into Inland Empire Utility Agency brine line at the intersection of Kimball and Euclid. The alignment of the alignment is primary within the city of Ontario and Caltrans right away, with a portion along Merrill within the city of uh, Chinos right away. There has been significant coordination with the city of Ontario on this project particularly concerning a development project within Ontario, which will be building infrastructure within Merrill during approximately the same construction window as the brine disposal pipeline. In order to avoid significant delays, it is critical that the Merrill portion of this project is completed prior to end of uh, October of this year. Um, on May 7th, 2021, the brine and disposal pipeline was put out to bid, and on June 22nd, nine bids were received. Nostra Plumbing and Engineering was deemed the lowest responsive, responsive and responsible bidder with a bid of $3,331,276. On June 28th, city received a protest letter. Um, the city reviewed the content of the letter. It was from an, uh, the, one of the bidders, um, but but city found no cause to disqualify Northstar and providers, and we provide a response on July 1st. Um, staff recommends award of construction contract to Northstar in amount of $3,331,276, plus a 15% contingency due to the fact that a portion of the project is in, in an undeveloped area with potential for unknown field conditions. Staff is also recommending purchase of additional brine and capacity units to accommodate the additional brine discharge flows and amendments to environmental and engineering contracts for the project. And the recommendations are included. There are seven recommendations and staff is recommending you approve uh, those if you wish to proceed with this project. That concludes my staff report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Amr. Are there any uh, items or, gosh, are there any members of the audience that would like to address the council on this item? See none. Council comments or questions? Okay, Amr, just one quick question. What do we spend per year right now to haul the brine to the uh, Sari line? Yeah, I do not have that information. I can get that for you. Okay, well, I think... Off it, memory, is you, it was roughly between two hundred fifty dollars to $500,000, depending upon how much... A year. Per, yep. And we won't be able to do that after the east side uh, plant is... Uh, expanded, correct? Correct. So this will pay itself off, you know, probably over, over a six to seven year period. Six to seven years? Yeah, and thereafter we'd be saving money. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, if there's no questions or issues, I would entertain a motion, please. Motion from Mayor Pro Tem Lucio, second from Councilperson Comstock. Item passes four yes, one absent. Item number 18, SN 211. FY 2020 to 21 Alley Sanitation Rehab Project Phase 1 and Phase 2. This item is to award a contract to Sequel Contractors Incorporated from Santa Fe Springs in the amount of $775,358 for Alley Sanitation Rehab Project Phase 1 and Phase 2. Maria Frazier, our CIP Engineering Manager, will provide us with a staff report. Maria? Good evening again, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, the item for your uh, consideration tonight is the award of the contract for the construction of the 2021-22 Alley Rehabilitation Project, which is um, SN211. The alleys chosen for SN211 include the alley between 9th Street and 10th Street from Chino Avenue to B Street, which we call Phase 1, and an alley segment from uh, Park Street to Yorba, north of Riverside, which we call phase three, which it was in pretty bad um, shape. 
The project was advertised on Planet Bits, the City Online Procurement website, and the Chino Champion newspaper. And on June 15, the city received seven bids via an electronic, electronic bid opening. A summary of the results is included in your staff report. CEQA contractors have, um, was deemed the, to be the lowest responsible and responsive bidder with a base bid amount of $775,358.40. This project is estimated to start um, approximately mid, late, mid to late August and completed by mid-December. Um, therefore, staff recommendation, the council approves the staff report with the recommendations indicated, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Anyone in the audience have questions on this item? Seeing none, council comments or questions? Nothing. Okay, I would entertain a motion and a second for approval, please. Motion from Councilperson Comstock, second from Councilperson Pocock. Item passes four yes with one absent. Item number 20, award a contract SD 200 Benson Avenue stain, stain, Storm Drain and Philadelphia Street to Francis. Award a construction contract in the amount of $1,848,455 to CP Construction Company Incorporated Santa Fe Springs for Storm Drain Improvement Project SD 200. Benson Avenue from Philadelphia to Francis. Maria, staff report, please. The last item for your consideration tonight is the award of the contract for the construction of the much needed Benson Avenue storm drain. This project consists of installation of approximately 2,800 lineal feet of pipe that vary from 66 inches to 36 inches in diameter. From Francis, to Philadelphia or it connects to an existing system that we uh, currently maintain. The system is part um, of the master plan of, of drainage adopted by the city of Chino. The project was advertised on Planet Bits, the city on, uh, online's procurement website and the Chino Champion. The city received 14 bids via an, an electronic bid opening on June 16. And a summary of those results are included in your staff report. CP construction from was deemed the, to be the lowest responsible and responsive bidder with a base bid amount base bid in the amount of one million eight hundred and forty eight thousand four hundred and fifty five dollars. We anticipate that should council authorize us tonight that the project is estimated to start approximately mid to late August and completed by mid to the end of December. This um, staff recommends that the council approves the staff report with the recommendations indicated. And this concludes my report, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Any can questions or comments from the audience? Seeing none, council comments? Malt, Walt? Thank you. Um, Maria, uh, this Benson Avenue is, is a dividing line between Ontario and Chino. So we're, we're going to run a storm drain down there. We're going to collect water, storm water, um, but on the, there's, Ontario property on the west side of Benson as it gets near Philadelphia. Correct. So are we going to collect that water uh, that coming off of that property, or how does that work? Um, we're basically following the drainage master plan, and, and what we're doing is collecting the water that is on that property, of course, because it's on that side, on, on the west side. So the majority of the storm drain is going to collect water that comes from north to south, which is actually impacting the Philadelphia intersection. So due to the, the logistics of the situation where the, the, the Ontario lies, yes, where we'll be collecting um, that runoff, which is another way to avoid it. However, in the design, we only added catch basins along the west side of the, the street, which means that we're collecting the water that we would already getting at the intersection from Ontario. We are not putting any catch basins on the east side and collect any additional waters that come from the Ontario side. Very good, thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? We really need this storm drain. That's one of the last places in 
what I call old Chino that has a flooding problem. Anybody that's driven on Basin during, on Benson during a, a rain event knows all the dirt washes to the center of the street and it's a mess. They have to close the street half the time, and get graders out there to get all the dirt and the mud off the street. Right. So it's, the kids in our floaties. Yeah, the kids have fun in the mud. <laughs> Well, I think this really definitely would help our maintenance people to oh. focus in other places that are Absolutely. more more needed. I know I've I've brought this up many times, and I hope we're going to approach them again. But I would really like to approach Ontario again to see if we can get that corner and those three houses into Chino, um, get it away from Ontario, and make that corner succinct where it's all Chino instead of a split between Chino and Ontario. Maybe give a, give Ontario some land that doesn't make any sense. It's in the city of Chino as well, over there on Mountain Avenue. So maybe we can clean up our boundaries a little bit also. Okay, then I would entertain a motion and a second to award this very badly needed storm drain. Motion from Councilperson Co Pocock and second from Mayor Pro Tem Lucio. Item passes for yes. Next on the agenda is Mayor and Council reports. Item number 21, Community Services Commission and Planning Commission appointments. This item is to ratify the appointment of Neil Jerry to the Community Services Commission and Curtis Burton to the Planning Commission. Um, I had the privilege of interviewing all of the applicants from both uh, commissions. Um, the Community Services Commission uh, appointment and interviews were conducted with Councilperson Comstock. Um, and then the Planning Commission interviews were conducted by myself and uh, Councilperson Pocock. So I would like to see if, Karen, would you like to make any comments about the interviews that were conducted for Community Services Commission? It was actually in my report, Mayor, but I will. It's, uh, I enjoyed that day. We actually had, I, I believe, six applicants. We interviewed five. Uh, I want to thank the members of the community who applied for this position, came out, took an interview. I thought overall, Mayor, that everybody that, that we interviewed that day did a very good job and just uh, um, thank them for their participation. And, and um, in the end, com my congratulations to Mr. Neil Jerry. Um, I think he's going to do a great job on the Community Services Commission. Yes, he... Uh, Neil has, has been involved in the community since 1999 and has spent many, many, many years as um, president and vice president of, of American Little League, I believe it was, and plus Pop Warner and, and just has a wealth of experience in our community. And um, prior to take ac in action on both of these, I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Neil Jerry to say a few words if you'd like, Neil. So first off, thank you very much um, to uh, Council Member Comstock and Mayor Yuloa. Um, I think the that, that day was, it was the theme was pride and how how proud I am to be a member of this city. And um, you know when um, Council Member Pocock went, introduced himself today, it was about a commission, and it was um, he was proud to tell me how he served a commission, and uh, that's what this city's all about, and that's why I'm so thankful to be here. Um, you know. Uh, City Manager Valentine, uh, you know, he came out numerous times to Chino National Little League and um, just uh, you know, showed his presence. Uh, Linda, um, for all the support that, that you gave, and Ted and uh, Judy Miller, and um, the list goes on, and I, I forget a bunch of people, um, so I don't want to keep naming anybody, but um, I'm, I'm proud to be on the commission, and, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity, and um, I, will, um, I will serve uh, to the best of my ability for this great city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Yeah. And then, of course, um, Councilman Pocock and I did the interviews for the Planning Commission. Walt, would you like to make some comments? Right. Uh, thank you. Well, w uh, it was a difficult decision, and, and uh, we, we uh, interviewed several uh, applicants for the position, and um, all applicants were really qualified and um, we had to uh, we had to pick one, so uh, we uh, chose uh, Curtis Burton, and um, look forward to working with him. And uh, I uh, encourage those that applied that didn't get the position 
please come back when there's another position available and uh, apply again. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I too enjoyed the interviews. We had some very, very qualified people, people who were very, very enthusiastic about the com community. We even had one um, lady that had only lived here, I think it was about a year, maybe even less than a year, and um, she just absolutely loves this community. But what was important to me in picking the applicant that we did was I wanted, as you know, Walt now is a council person, and he vacated that position. And, and he left that commission a whole of years and years and years and years of experience in this community. And what impressed me with the person that we did pick, which is Kurt Burton, and I'll ask him to come up and speak in a minute, is he's been here for a long, long time, and, and his background has enabled him to know this community, know every aspect of this community, good and bad. And I think, I think his detailed knowledge of the community, because he was a police officer here and retired, um, I think that will help in the planning commission because as he looks at development, I think he'll also look at it with his experience in mind. And so safety for example, you know, and, and how traffic flows and, and aspects of things that maybe someone that doesn't have police knowledge wouldn't even think of. So I was very impressed with Kurt and so enthusiastically support him. Would you like to say a few words, Mr. Burton? Well, I'd like to thank the, uh, the council, Mayor and Council for selecting me for the position. Uh, I do have a love for this community. I've been here for over 30 years. I know where we've come from. I know the direction that the council has given uh, the commissions now and, and the direction that they'd like to go. But I also think that the future is very, very important in this community. And we talk about balance. And I, I think it's important right now for uh, the commissions to think about that. I know they, they have been, but with the future growth of this community, balance is extremely necessary and it's something that we need to continue to look at. Uh, I hope that uh, me going on to the commission will just enhance uh, the great job that they've been doing for many, many years, uh, having uh, Council Member Pocock head of that commission for so long. Uh, you've done a terrific job and I look forward to getting back to work right here in the city of Chino. Okay, so thank, you. thank you, Kurt. Okay, with that, then I would ask for a motion and a second to ratify the appointments of Neil Jerry to fill the vacancy on Community Services Commission ending June 30th, 2022, and Kurt, Burson, Kurt Burton to fill the vacancy on the Planning Commission ending January 1st, 2024, and conduct an oath of office for both individuals. There's a motion from Councilperson Comstock, second from Councilperson Pocock. And the item passes for yes. Gentlemen, would you please come forward? And I believe our city clerk, Angela Robles, will um, conduct the oath of office. I, Curtis Burton. Neil Jerry. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Thank you very much. Congratulations, gentlemen, and we expect big things from you, too. 
Okay, following my report, uh, it's pretty lengthy. I'm going to try to cut it way down and not give details. So Wednesday, June 26th, <clears throat> I attended the mayor's prayer breakfast. I attended a meeting uh, at Claremont Council Member Corey Kaleke's home that evening, which was attended by local elected officials from cities within four counties who meant to share various issues of concern that might lead to the establishment of a coalition of support for some of these issues to lobby our legislators for either help or relief. The group is going to try to meet monthly and we'll see where it leads. Thursday, June 17th, I virtually attended the Water Facilities Authority Board of Directors meeting. Uh, virtually attended Watermaster Advisory Committee meeting and I attended the memorial service of former fire board member and community services Jim Com uh, Commissioner Jim Espinoza. Saturday, June 19th, I attended the Father's Day event at Pacifica along with Corporal Ryan Tillman. Uh, it was a really nice event. They had music and food booths and vendor booths and a car show for the residents. Monday, June 21st, I have to put this in there, Bob and I went to dinner with friends to celebrate our 46th wedding anniversary. That man deserves a trophy. Tuesday, June 22nd, I met with Mr. Greg Marquez, who is intending on running for the District 2 Council seat in 2022, virtually attended the West Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District Board of Directors meeting. Thursday, June 24th, I attended the City County's conference held at Ontario Convention Center along with Councilperson Pocock uh, and Flores and our city manager. Then I have virtually attended the Chino de Salta Authority Finance Committee um, and that evening attended the Police Department's Forum uh, held again. That was an excellent forum and I hope a lot of people watched it online. I was really sad that more people didn't attend personally, but I understand. Friday, June 25th, I met with Peter Whittingham of Whittingham Public Affairs Advisors and David Perez of Valley Vista Services regarding their interest in locating a materials recovery facility in Chino. Saturday, June 26th, <clears throat> a bunch of us attended the uh, fireworks spectacular, which turned out absolutely fantastic. And I think the community was thrilled that we had such a good event. Monday, June 28th, along with Council Member Con uh, Comstock, conducted the interviews for an open position of the Community Services Commission. Tuesday, June 29th, along with Councilmember Pocock, conducted interviews for an open position on the Planning Commission. Wednesday, June 30th, met with Chino Hills Councilmember Ray Marquez regarding mutual concerns with the 71 Freeway, Euclid Avenue, and Pine Avenue. Thursday, July 1st, <clears throat> I virtually attended the Water Facilities Technical Advisory Committee, virtually attended the Chino de Salta Authority Board of Directors, I won't go through those details. Virtually attended the Inland Empire Agency Sewage Policy Committee meeting. On Friday, July 2nd, threw out the first pitch at the Girls Fast Pitch Milk Can Tournament. That was really fun, and uh, Ted Bistarki helped me. My first pitch, I threw it in the dirt, and the second pitch, no, the first pitch, I missed the pitcher, <laughs> the catcher, and the second pitch hit it. I threw it in the dirt. Got to practice before next year. Saturday, July 3rd, I attended the Chino LDS Church's July 4th flag raising event, which is an annual event I always look forward to going to, uh, near Pancake Breakfast. Our own retired police officer, John Vega, is their new bishop. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised to see him. And, of course, today, uh, before the meeting, I attended, along with other council members at different times, the demographics information for our meeting tonight about the redistricting process. And that's all I did between the last council meeting and now. Holy cow. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem Lucio. Mine's uh, significantly shorter than that. I was on vacation for a week. Uh, 16th, I attended the Mayor's Prayer Breakfast. Uh, 26th, I attended the Chino Fireworks Spectacular, great event, uh, a lot of people out there, it was, it was good to see everybody again. The 28th, I uh, met with the city manager, uh, just about recent activity in the city. On July 2nd, I had a, we had a meeting with uh, some members of the Planning Commission, the city attorney, and uh, the city manager regarding some of the, the direction that we'd like to go in, uh, hopefully for the future. Uh, 
July 6th today, I, I ended up attending the, the demographic uh, redistricting meeting before the city council meeting. That's all I have. Okay, council member Constock. Mayor, on June 16th, I met with the city manager and director Liguori, uh, as you directed to do some follow-up work to assist with completing our arena maps um, uh, focus. I wanna thank both Matt and Nick and staff for all the work that you're doing on that project and hopefully we can get that wrapped up soon. On June 17th, I attended the Celebration of Life Services for Jim Espinoza. I thought his family did a very good job with that and boy, did that one speaker who eulogized him uh, do a great job. So Jim will certainly be missed in this community. On June 26th, I attended the Fireworks Spectacular at Ayala Park uh, along with the rest of the council. Uh, Dr. Reich uh, and your staff did a great job out there. It was very nice to have everybody come back out as already previously mission, mentioned. And not just that, but I think the attendees do a great job every year of, of really conducting themselves in, in a manner which makes the city uh, proud. Uh, uh, and just putting so many people in one place uh, with, with very few problems is always a, makes it always a very nice event every year. So kudos to the public as well. On June 28th, I attended a tour at the Inland Empire Utilities Agency and learned a tremendous about, about this operation down there. It specifically deals, as you know, with wastewater uh, reclamation. Uh, they're undergoing quite a large expansion down there and if, as a result of the anticipated growth in the south part of the city, as well as uh, Archibald Ranch. So we're gonna need that, those services in the future. Um, my thanks to Director Ely and the staff at IEUA for their help and for the tour. On June 28th, I, along with the mayor, participated in the interviews for the Community Services Commission, as we covered earlier this evening. And on June 28th, I attended the Community Services Commission later here in the city council chambers. And on July 1st, I attended a meeting with community services staff at the community building. I wanted to thank them for all their hard work. It seemed appropriate since it was Parks and Recreation Month to go thank them for that, as well as to talk to them about uh, their hard work and exceptional community program I think we're all very, very blessed to have such a robust community services program here in Chino. So I wanted to personally go thank them. Tonight before the council meeting, I also attended a meeting regarding the Voter Rights Act and our, with our demographic specialists in preparation for our public meetings and our voter districting within the next election cycle. And that concludes my report, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Pocock. Thank you. Mine is rather bre brevity uh, compared to those. On 624, I attended the San Bernardino City County conference with uh, Mayor Uloa and city manager and, and uh, Councilman Flores six, on 624. I also attended uh, the conversation with the community at the police department, which was very well put on. Thank you. Uh, 626, fireworks spectacular, which was really a spectacular. Mm -hmm. And um, hasn't been mentioned yet, but the two jets that flew over at the beginning of the uh, event was really cool. It was two Air Force jets. Mm -hmm. And um, then 629 uh, interviewed for the planning commissioners. And uh, today, the demographics and uh, redistribution information meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A cute story about that, uh, the jet flyover is staff tried so hard to time that exactly right so that my comments would end and the jets would fly over and we were five minutes off so i finished and i looked at my watch we have five minutes and ted goes ad lib ad lib what do you, <laughs> what do you want me to say so had to fill in the gap and then but boy at 7 10 they flew over it was really really cool that was nice city manager ballantyne Yes, thanks, Mayor and Council. Um, I too want to thank uh, the Community Services Commission, or no, not the Community Services Commission, but the Community Services Department, uh, the Police Department, and also Public Works for a successful uh, Fourth of July event that we hosted uh, last weekend or the weekend before. Um, also, want to note I know the Mayor had mentioned this um, the Preserve and Chino office hours are going to be held this Thursday. And I want to thank the Police Officers Association. They're going to be bringing out their barbecue. So we look forward to uh, folks joining us this Thursday, beginning at 5.30. Um, I'd also like to provide an update uh, as it relates to Merrill Avenue and the closure of Kimball. And with that, I'd like to invite our city engineer, Chris Magdascu, to provide a briefing. Thank you, Matt. 
Short answer, Merrill is opening this week between Bonview and Flight, and then Kimball will shut down next week for the next staggered closure. The only thing we're working out right now is one last poll has to get stood on Merrill, and then we're running into a situation where SCE was supposed to flip the switch, and they're not calling back FedEx, so we're gonna look at some alternative traffic control devices to make it safe if they don't flip the switch and make that stop controlled if we need to, but it has to open. We have to continue with Kimball to, to have that. I'll know more as the week progresses and we'll update the council and the community. And then my uh, video is going out, I think tomorrow or Thursday, talking about all that, including Pine and the rest of Merrill. So and that's you'll be we're there we're Thursday to update I'll be there Thursday too. With preserve another. community? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully with the police barbecue, there'll be a lot of people attending this time. That's why I'm going. Yeah. Hope so. Yeah. Feed them and they'll come, right? Chris, I missed how long we expected Kimball to be closed at this phase. I'm sorry. Uh, July through mid-December, they had some delays because they were held up the, from Bickmore, which then led up to Merrill, and they had to do work at night, and some of that's delayed some of the, the work on Kimball, but it's going to be July through December. It's going to be really tough. Yeah. But Bickmore will be open. Merrill will be open. There will be no trucks on Kimball. That will be nice. Uh, but we're going to work with them on shortening that up as much as possible. Okay, thank you. A lot of utilities going in there, and I'll elaborate on Thursday as well. And the video has some. But just to be clear on, on Kimball, this is the ultimate width, so hopefully yeah, we'll be it's done with that, plus the drainage from the airport. Will that be is correct. Yes. That'll be nice. Yes. So it'll be a nightmare for a while, but this is it. And it'll be good for a few months, and then we'll do Pine next year. Okay. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Anything else, Matt? No, that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Galante, anything from the city attorney's office? Thank you, Mayor. No report tonight. Okay. Chief Simmons. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, yes, there's nothing better than a hot dog cooked by a police officer. <laughs> so come on out on Thursday. Please, uh, please join us. Uh, be a lot of good, good information out there as well. Um, our 4th of July deployment was very successful in collaboration with our partners at Chino Valley Fire. We issued 47 citations on Sunday. That's up from 33 the year before, and then in 2019 we had issued 40. Um, uh, that was done in conjunction with putting out unmarked cars, police officers on unmarked cars, so we can uh, catch people in the act, as well as our unmanned aircraft systems out there. We also could uh, zoom in and catch people uh, lighting, lighting illegal fireworks in the act. Um, prior to the 4th of July, we also conducted six uh, by bust operations where uh, we bought illegal or met people who thought we were going to buy illegal fireworks from them, and then we promptly took their illegal fireworks and issued them a $1,000 fine. Um, one success is the social media companies have actually clamp down on people selling illegal fireworks on their on their forums. So it was much harder for them to sell it and harder for law enforcement to catch them. But uh, we did catch them. And as I said, it was very successful. And I'm pleased to report there were no major incidents on the 4th of July. It was a fun, safe night. And our community uh, enjoyed that celebration. Well, you know, before the actual 4th, I was really hopeful because around our area, and we're kind of on the border of Ontario, there were a lot less illegal fireworks being set off, so I was really hopeful that on the 4th of July it would be calm. No such luck. No. Uh, the people that apparently had uh, restrained themselves before the 4th let go. They, they, and there were some, I, I can't even tell you the explosions that were going on. I mean, it was like bombs were being left. I was so angry. I mean, I was just angry because I, I really thought with the house that blew up in Ontario, with the stuff that L.A. had confiscated that blew that bomb truck up, I thought people are finally catching on how dangerous this stuff is. But there are still fools on 4th of July that just can't resist. And, I, you know, I'm thankful that no one was hurt, but the aerial stuff was nuts. It was just crazy, and I don't understand why neighbors don't report this because it's dangerous to them as well. It's just it's frustrating to me. I think we're getting better, and then 
They just blow my hopes up, literally. So thank you for the report. You're welcome. Thank you. Chief, thanks to your team out there too. Um, not just on July 4th, I, you know, as I know how difficult of a deployment that is and a long day, but also to your team out there at the Fireworks Spectacular. They did Thank a great you. job. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Chief Shackelford, now we're going to get more statistics. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, just a, a couple comments for tonight. I wanted to tag on to what Chief Simmons stated and just thank the men and women of the police department for their efforts with enforcement. Uh, we did see a dramatic reduction in fireworks related activity on the 4th. So I would like to acknowledge the mayor's comments. We still do have a significant issue in our city with illegal fireworks. Uh, but I'd also like to thank the vast majority of our residents that celebrated responsibly and, and encourage them to continue to do so. And as you stated, Mayor, please report your neighbors if they are using illegal fireworks. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to share with the council and the public, you may see a Chino Valley Fire Ambulance on the streets. Uh, recently, American Medical Response, which is the uh, primary provider of, of uh, ambulance transportation in our county, shared with us that they are having some challenges with staffing. Uh, with that, they reached out to the fire service and asked for some assistance. So on specific dates and times, we have staffed the ambulance. Good. So the public may see that, uh, and we are providing that service. The residents we transport will not be charged for the service. I think that's fantastic, and I, I would really like to see that contract changed to where our own fire department has the ambulance service and not AMR. would really like to see that. We are hopeful that this will open the door for some further conversations as the Board of Supervisors evaluates that ambulance contract in the near future. Thank you. Thank Chief you, Mayor. So. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing else to come before the council, then we will adjourn to our next meeting, which will be held on Tuesday, Ju July 20th at 7 o'clock. Closed session at 6 o'clock if necessary. We are adjourned. Together.